So I will call this meeting of April 21st, 2022 to order. Uh, first, we will hear from our technical facilitator. All right, welcome to our virtual plan commission meeting. We're going to cover a few basic items before beginning. If you lose connection at any point during the meeting, you can reconnect by clicking the link or calling on the number in your original email. To members and city staff members, if you are able, please activate your video and keep it on for the duration of the meeting. Staff, if you are able, please activate your video when you are speaking. The chair, clerk, and technical facilitator responsible for muting and unmuting committee members. Use the raise hand feature when you'd like to be recognized to speak, ask questions, or request a roll call vote. During any roll call, all panelists will be unmuted briefly. Staff, click raise hand when you are asked a question. The chair will do their best to call on committee members in the order in which their hands are raised. Lowering your hand will take you out of the queue. Members who, of the public who have registered to speak, the name you entered in Zoom must match the name you entered in registration. You will remain muted until called upon. The clerk will tell you when your time is up. After speaking, a member of the body may ask you a question. If you need to share documentation with the commission, please send it to the email list in today's agenda. Chair, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, moving on then, um, the first item on our agenda is the public comment. And I don't believe we have any public comment. Is that correct, Heather? Okay. Okay. Then next is communications, disclosures, and recusals. Members of the body should make any required disclosures or recusals under the city's ethics code. Do we have any disclosures or recusals? I don't see any raised hands. Um, we do have an introduction though that Heather was going to make of a new staff member. Heather? Thank you, Chair Zell. I'm so excited to welcome this evening Lisa McNabula, who's just recently joined the planning division. Um, she'll be on the development review team, and so you'll start to see Lisa um, in the months to come. Uh, Lisa comes to us from Fitchburg, so very familiar with the region, the growing region, and has so much to offer, great perspective. We're really looking forward to, to working with Lisa. Lisa, do you want to say a quick hello? Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Heather. Uh, this is Lisa, and I look forward to uh, working with everyone in the future. Thanks. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, the minutes of the um, March 7th meeting. Um, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Seeing no raised hands, is there a motion to approve? Uh, moved by Commissioner Cantrell, is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Fernandez. And I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, the motion passes unanimously. Okay, then uh, next is the schedule of our upcoming meetings. The regular meetings are scheduled for April 11th, April 25th, May 9th, and May 23rd, and all of those are at 530. And then we do have a special plan commission meeting this Thursday, March 24th, and that one will begin at 5 p.m. Okay, next we have um, our consent agenda. It is the custom and, and it also include can include uh, routine uh, business or new business. It is the custom of the plan commission to remove from the agenda those items on which staff believes an application has had sufficient review to warrant approval with all of the conditions placed upon it by the various city departments. 
on which the application accepts those conditions. And there are no individuals who have registered to speak in opposition to the item. Those um, are put on our consent agenda and are addressed at the beginning of our meeting. Then people who are interested in those items can disconnect um, unless a member of the plan commission requests separation, in which case the item is removed from the consent agenda and taken in the regular course of business. And we do also include on the consent agenda those items um, to be referred or which have been withdrawn. So the first item, which would be on the consent agenda is agenda item two for referral, Legistar 70109 to be referred to the April 11th plan commission meeting. Agenda item four, also for referral and also to April 11th, 2022, Legistar 69518. Um, and then on consent, agenda item eight, Legistar 68694, agenda item nine, Legistar 69566, and being withdrawn by the applicant, agenda item 10, Legistar 69783, for referral to April 25th, Legistar 69785, um, agenda item 11. And then also on the consent agenda, agenda item 13, Legistar 69789, and agenda item 14, Legistar 69788. Are there any requests for separation? Seeing no requests for separation, I will read the items for uh, referral into our record. Again, agenda item two, Legistar 70109, authorizing the execution of a lease with Selco Partnership. Um, agenda item four, Legistar 69518, uh, amending the City of Madison's official map. Agenda item eight, Legistar 68694, located at 1325 through 1337 Greenway Cross, 14th Alder District, consideration of a conditional use in the commercial corridor transitional district for a restaurant nightclub tenant in a multi-tenant commercial building. Agenda item nine, Legistar 69566, located at 557 North Street, 12th Alder District, consideration of a conditional use in the neighborhood mixed use district for a brew pub, consideration of a conditional use for an outdoor seating area, condition it, um, consideration of a conditional use for freestanding vending located within 200 feet of the property line of a lot with a residential use and consideration of a conditional use for a parking reduction of more than 20 automobile spaces and 25% or more of the required parking to allow an existing commercial building to be converted to a multi-food and beverage establishment, related goods, sales, outdoor eating area, and a food cart. Uh, agenda item 10, Legistar 69783, which was withdrawn by the applicant and should be placed on file without prejudice. For referral, Agenda item 11, Legistar 69785, located on seven at 3734 Speedway Road uh, for a consideration of a demolition permit. Uh, agenda item 13, Legistar 69789, located at 5501 Endeavor Lane, 19th Alder District, consideration of a conditional use in the Suburban Employment District for a building exceeding 68 feet in height to allow construction of a five-story office 
laboratory building. And finally, agenda item 14, Legistar 69788, located at 3313 through 3315 Nelson Road, Town of Burke, consideration of a certified survey map within the city's extraterritorial jurisdiction to redivide two residential lots. Um, do I have a motion? Moved um, by here. Um, could you make your motion, Commissioner Cantrell? Um, I'll move approval of the consent agenda and the referrals um, and, and the other items that, as you've indicated. Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Solheim. And since there are no um, people wishing to speak, I'll open the public hearing, close the public hearing, um, and I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands to object, the consent agenda is approved. Then the first item on our agenda uh, to be heard is the zoning text amendment. It is agenda item three, Legistar 70198, amending Madison ordinances to allow for residential uses on the ground floor of buildings within the lesser of 40% or 40 feet in mixed use and multifamily buildings on specified downtown streets. And uh, do we have a presentation um, by Matt Tucker or Katie? Uh, Matt Tucker, okay. Matt. Actually, I think I do think Katie is going to, uh, going to present this. Yeah. Very good. Okay, Katie, go ahead. Yeah, so we don't have a formal presentation for you today. Um, this is um, a relatively straightforward uh, zoning text amendment before you today. We've heard some interest from developers in um, having some additional residential possible on particular downtown streets where today it's not allowed. Um, this amendment would still require some commercial um, activity along these particular street frontages as named in the um, zoning text amendment proposal before you today while allowing um, some first floor residential on floors um, away from that front main frontage. Um, that's just a very brief overview, but happy to answer any questions you have. Okay, thank you, Katie. Um, are there any questions of Katie? Okay, and we know, have no registrants wishing to speak, uh, then I would be looking for a motion. Commissioner Cantrell. I will uh, move that the uh, Planning Commission forward like to star 70198 to the City Council with a recommendation of approval. Thank you. Do we have a second? Seconded by Alder Heck. Commissioner Cantrell, did you wish to speak to your motion? No. Okay, um, any discussion, comments? Seeing none, we'll come to a vote and I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands to object, the motion passes unanimously. Next item on the agenda is agenda item five and that is to be, um, considered along with agenda item six. So Legistar 69965, creating a section of the Madison General Ordinances to am amend a planned development district as properties located at 700 through 740 Regent Street, 4th Alder District, amending the PUD GDP plan development and uh, to approve a specific implementation plan. 
Also, Legistar 69572, approving a certified survey map of property owned by 700 Regent Street Associates and Park Street LLC and 740 Regent Street Associates Alexander Company Incorporated at 700 through 740 Regent Street, 4th Alder District. And I believe we're going to hear from um, Colin Punt about this one. All right. Thank you. Uh, so before the commission now uh, is 740 Regent Street for a 12-story uh, residential building uh, as an amendment to the existing plan development district uh, with the associated certified survey map. Uh, for this uh, proposal, the, co the comprehensive plan uh, recommends employment and the downtown plan recommends predominant employment for the area. However, the downtown plan does note that a mix of uses can be included uh, in predominant employment areas uh, of specific note regarding the large residential use uh, is its specific site and situation um, within a surface parking lot behind several office buildings. Uh, in order to improve the residential environment for the proposal, staff have strongly encouraged and worked with the applicant uh, to activate the first floor spaces, uh, particular, particularly along the adjacent uh, multi-use path. Uh, all things considered, staff believes the proposal uh, could meet the standards for plan developments and zoning map amendments, uh, but do have some concerns regarding uh, how much of the, the long building facades are dedicated to parking and do not include uh, a visually permeable front uh, revealing the active uses within the building. Uh, as always, I am uh, happy to answer any questions uh, after the public hearing. Thank you, Colin. And we do have registrants, so I will open the public hearing. The first uh, person we will hear from is Linda Irving, um, 200 Main Street, uh, Lafayette, Indiana, support wishing to speak. And I believe she is either the developer or representing the developer. Linda, could you clarify? And you do have three minutes. Uh, sure, there's no person by the by that name, but I do have an Irving, and it's the only one in registration that may follow that name, other than um, the person working with that developer. So we're going to give that a shot. Okay. I think you just unmuted me, correct? Colin, yep. you have the slides, right? And you are Linda Irving? I am. Thank and you. And are you the developer? Yes, I am the developer. Uh, th right. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Um, Colin, if you could possibly go ahead and go to the second uh, uh, slide, please. All right. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm Linda Irving. I'm with Trinitas Ventures. I'm the project executive for the project that we're presenting tonight. We're very excited to be here after several months of working with a number of uh, public entities. Um, I'll begin by referencing the staff report statement that the site of our proposed development was identified in the 2012 Madison Downtown Plan, plan as an underutilized site. We have a vision um, of building upon the precedent that was set forth by the Hilton Garden Inn development, uh, transforming another section of the surface parking field into a viable and active use for a residential project. The proposed PD will bring another use to the overall track that currently is office tracked with hotel um, while, incre while increasing the density and variety on the block. The proposed development will provide 341 new apartments for approximately 681 residents, include a resident club lounge, fitness center, multiple elevated outdoor landscape terraces, and a rooftop pool. The project will solve to the current and future needs for the parking of the surrounding office buildings, hotels, supplemental Coles event parking, and our residential needs by including an embedded parking structure with approximately 344 spaces. The project will include 473 bike spaces with room for up to 500. The apartment community will be professionally staffed and operated and managed at the local level with on-site property management, typically hired directly from the community. And we anticipate this will be creating about 16 new permanent jobs. The development is not anticipated to have any negative economic impacts to the community, increased costs of municipal services, or require additional public infrastructure. 
The project will bring significant incremental tax dollars to the newly created TID district, approximately 1.5 million plus annually and uh, potentially $26 million over the life of the TID 48. As many are aware, this pro this through this provision, the city is able to fund affordable housing projects such as the Bayview project directly across the street and related public infrastructure that the entire community can benefit from. The project will also be contributing $1.7 million to the Madison Park Fund. We believe this project will elevate the activity, visual interest, and safety of the entire block from end to end along the bike path and be a positive addition to the community. Tonight, our team will walk you through the project design that embraced feedback from a number of community and public meetings. Uh, this updated presentation will address suggestions and comments from the March 9th UDC meeting and the current staff report with illustrations and solutions. To that end, we intend to demonstrate ground level activation, pedestrian connectivity, massing solutions that address the zero zero lot line restrictions of the balconies on the northwest side, visually relay the internal courtyard experience and program, and present an updated landscape plan that addresses specific current concerns regarding plant material selections and quantities. We believe the overall project benef uh, the overall project benefited from all the collective feedback we received, and we're here tonight hoping to gain uh, planning commission approval of the project this evening. Thank you, Linda. Okay. With that, I'm going to turn it over to um, my associate. Oh, thank, thank you, Linda. That concludes your available time. The uh, next registrant is uh, Joe Mayer, um, Winifred Road, uh, Warrenville, Illinois, uh, representing Trinitas Development um, of Chicago. Joe, you have three minutes. Yes, hopefully you can hear me. Yes. Uh, yeah, so my name is Joe Mayer. I'm with Kimley Horn. Uh, Kimley Horn, we are the civil engineering team on this project. Um, so yeah, Colin, you can stay at slide two. Um, I just wanted to quickly highlight a couple of the site items and then I can answer any technical re questions related to civil um, afterwards. Um, but I'll expand uh, upon Linda mentioning how the site is classified as underutilized by the city of Madison, the, the current and governing development plan from 1998 allows the Alexander Company to build a three-story parking garage for the length of the proposed development. Uh, and that entitlement allows for 340 parking spaces in the freestanding structure. Uh, today, 24 years later, the amended plan would only propose four more spaces while providing parking for the five different users. Uh, the reason we highlight that is it, it's a substantial accomplishment and it, it exemplifies how we are designing a smart, sustainable project that serves multiple needs and a compressed footprint. Um, Colin, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll ask you to quickly flip through slides three through seven, and you can stop when you get to slide eight. But these are just some site photos to see the current state of the commuter path uh, from Washington to Campus Mall. And you can see it has very little activation and is predominantly the rear yards of the buildings uh, with a, just a large surface parking field along its frontage. Um, the only exception being the Hilton Garden Inn's uh, recently constructed restaurant and patio. Um, and there's almost no landscaping and, and very limited lighting for pedestrian safety along that path. Um, a, a second thing I wanted to highlight was just sustainability in general. So uh, one of the things that this development is doing is it's investing in uh, the redevelopment of a half acre of city owned land along the commuter path. Um, and that's generally shown in green uh, on the image on the bottom left. And we're converting it to 70% of new green space. Um, and another item is that the property is, is a brownfield, um, if you're not aware of the history of the site and its associated use with the railroad. Um, and the, the developer will be doing an extensive investment to remediate approximately one and a half acres of soil. And then lastly, we're, we're proposing other green infrastructure uh, in conjunction with our stormwater management plan. Colin, if you don't mind going to the next slide. Uh, in, in regard to pedestrian connectivity, uh, there were concerns about pedestrian connections that were mentioned in our prior meetings and also by neighborhood associations. We're really pleased to demonstrate via this slide the increased connectivity throughout the area brought forth by this development. There are safe, well-lit paths connecting the office buildings, the hotel, and users of the bike path to Regent Street and, and the local bus stops. You can see those paths highlighted in blue um, and then the vehicular paths highlighted in red and the bike path uh, in the light blue. Um, and Colin, if you don't mind going to the next slide, uh, 
this is our, our site plan image with the building overlay. Um, thank, thank you, Joseph. That in, uh, concludes your available time. Our next registrant is Robert Muller, LaSalle Street, Chicago, in support, wishing to speak, uh, representing Trinitas Ventures. Uh, Robert, you have three minutes. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Colin. So I'm just going to talk about the big picture of massing of the project. This massing evolved from the panhandle shape of the site. Our original concept was well received in the informal review by the UDC. And what you're seeing on screen are further refinements based on comments from the UDC and others. Big picture, the building is split into two distinct masses by a slot down the middle in which four floors of units have been removed and a 14 foot shift between the forward mass and the rear mass. Next slide, please. Given that the building is taller than its neighbors, we focused our efforts on creating a four-sided design with each elevation receiving equal consideration as evidenced by the design of the Regent Street facing facades you're seeing in this image. Next slide, please. In response to concerns about the ground floor design, we've removed parking and increased the level of activity along the bike path and have made a more prominent visible entry to the building promoting safety and security. You can see that in the foreground of this image. Next slide, please. And part of our active ground floor strategy involves de designating a location for food truck parking and providing adjacent plaza parking. And that can be in the foreground of this image. Next slide. This image shows the access from Regent Street to the main entrance, which um, has a very direct pedestrian friendly route of approach from Regent. Next slide. And this is the access to the west end of the building where the services are, as well as where the food trucks would park. Next slide. This slide is along the bike path and it shows the terracing effect of the shift in the building creates the opportunity for visual connection and activity on multiple levels along the bike path. And you can see the introduction of a graphic screen that masks the bike storage area that's between the parking and the bike path. So you're seeing food a uh, food truck area on the left and the lobby and new ground floor computer lounge are just off the image to the right. Next slide. Uh, here we have a view showing the visual connection between the ground level and upper terrace experience along the bike path. We've introduced a gathering lawn zone adjacent to the bike path, add raised planners next to the building, and developed an engaging graphic screen in the perforated metal panel areas that you're seeing with the flamingos. Next slide. And here's a view of the northeast end of the building showing the staff offices, a bike repair station, and entry stairs in outdoor dining and seating space that caters to our food truck zone. So there's a great deal of activity all along the bike path, whether it be via food trucks. Thank you, Robert. That concludes your available time. Our next registrant is Renato Gilberti, uh, South LaSalle Rookery in Chicago in support wishing to speak, uh, representing Trinitas Ventures. Uh, Renato, you have three minutes. Thank you. Um, I would now like to walk you through a series of vignettes where, based upon recommendations from the UDC, we've introduced various elements to activate the pedestrian space along the north and west sides of the building. Uh, Colin, if you can go to the next slide, please. Here we have an evening view of the building entry on the northwest corner, where we've increased the street level of activation through the introduction of a computer lab and a study lounge in what was formerly part of the parking garage. Next slide. Here we have another view of the main entry of the building uh, that looks down the pedestrian sidewalk uh, along the north side. We've introduced a canopy per the UC suggestions on both the west and north sides to emphasize the fact that this is the primary entry point. Next slide. Here's the same view in the evening with the canopy, lobby, and landscape elements lit up. Next slide. This is a view of the southwest corner where our leasing offices are located. This model is in progress, but this view represents our entry approach to the building coming from Regent Street. Next slide. 
Here's a view of the northwest corner showing the relationship between our entry plaza and the outdoor dining space of the Hilton Garden Inn. Next, another view of the pedestrian path looking toward the east along the north facade. Next slide. Here we have a close up of our perforated metal panel screen system, both during the day and nighttime, showing the layering effect of the screen with the bike room behind it, which in turn screens the parking garage from pedestrian view. Next. Another view, another view showing the visual con uh, connection. Hang on, I think you skipped one. Here we go. I actually skipped a couple. All right, I'll, go, I'll just jump on. Here's a view. A go back to the previous one, Colin. Here Here's a view of the bike uh, room and repair station entry stair. Next slide. And finally, here's a view from the food truck zone looking toward the west and along the north facade. Next. As requested in the UDC meeting, we have created several vignettes that touch on the courtyard experience from various viewpoints. Each outdoor, uh, each outdoor opportunity is precisely programmed by property management to engage the resident in a specific and unique way. We're excited about the score yard and movie and game garden as it provides an indoor outdoor boutique experience that is open to the sky, but is uniquely protected from the cold, harsh winds. Next. This unique space presents a perfect opportunity for a large movie and sports viewing, resident group games, and semi-private gatherings. We're also exploring the inclusion of a fire pit element along this focal wall. Next, here's the same view rendered in the evening with all the landscape, landscape elements lit up. Next, we have included a viewing window at each floor, allowing daylight into the resident quarters and providing them with a chance to see what is happening outside and join in the fun. Next. Here we have a view looking down into the courtyard. Just like the rest of the building, the courtyard units will have operable windows consisting of a large seven foot by seven foot living room window and a smaller uh, window at each bedroom. Thank We're you, Renato. Looking... That concludes your available time. The next registrant is uh, Brady Halverson, uh, North 2nd Street, Minneapolis, in support wishing to speak, representing Trinitas Development. Brady, you have three minutes. Hello, everyone. I'm Brady. I'm with BKV Group in Minneapolis. Uh, Colin, could we please go ahead about, I'll say when, after these elevations, we will hit landscape plans. There we go. I'm the landscape architect. Um, as a few people have touched on previously in this discussion, uh, our primary goal at ground level on this project, and far and away, I think the most important objective is to activate the, the greenway side of this, activate the, the side along the trail. Um, it's a pretty long stretch right now that does not have a lot of greenery, does not have a lot of gathering places other than the, the small Hilton Garden Inn uh, plaza adjacent to us. So we've got a really great opportunity here to activate that side and um, provide green space uh, along the commuter trail create a node. There aren't a lot of nodes along the, along the commuter trail right now, so it's a spot people can actually stop as opposed to just moving through. Um, making a place here where our site interacts with the context of the neighborhood, um, we're, we really believe this is a huge opportunity for placemaking. Um, we want to provide an opportunity for people to get off their bikes and sit and, you know, have a snack from a food truck or eat their lunch or whatever, as was mentioned a, a few times. Um, the second image from the top is the uh, is the upper level space that you saw in some of the 3D renderings earlier that's up on the third floor. And uh, it's really a cascading effect of the landscape. We want to cascade from all the way down uh, from the top of the building down to the greenway on that side. Um, we called it the edge green. It's a, a more private experience for the residents who live here. Um, a chance for them to get outside and engage with the, the trail without actually physically being engaged with the trail. Um, it looks out over that space and it's a continuation from a design standpoint of what's going on down at ground level. Materiality will be similar, plants will be similar. What we're calling the perch is higher up on the building. It's more about views. It's more about a space for private gatherings, uh, studying outside, et cetera. Uh, the game and theater garden Renato just touched on in the renderings. That's a, a space for, you know, flexible space for movies or sports on the big screen, outdoor dining, outdoor games. 
the character of that space is green and lush. We want to use a carefully selected palette of plants that really is going to make it feel like a shade garden. And then the sky deck is really all about being way up in the air, getting the views of Brigham Bay and Lake Wingra. And, you know, you're up above the other buildings. We're going to have a spectacular view up there. And we think this is going to be a really great sky deck and pool deck. Next slide, please. In response to some of the con uh, some of the uh, comments that we got with UDC um, related to plant list. We had previously submitted something that was not uh, not really a fleshed out planting plan. It was really kind of a skeleton of a planting plan. There were some plants that were potentially even inappropriate in their use, and there were others that were just fairly simple in how we were describing them. So we've spent a good deal of time in the last few weeks really fleshing that out and uh, coming to a list that is almost exclusively natives now. Uh, maybe we could go to the next slide since we're running out of time. Um, did you catch that? Next slide. So, oh. And that does conclude your available time, Brady. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, the next registrant is Adam Winkler, Penny Lane, Madison in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions representing the Alexander Company. Uh, Joseph Alexander, Highlands, South Highlands Avenue in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. Um, and hold on, let me see if there's anybody else here. Um, Nathan Wadier, support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. Eli Sarofsky, uh, North Carroll Street, Madison, in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions, representing the Campus Area Neighborhood Association. And that is it. Um, are there any questions of any of our registrants? Alder Heck. Thank you. Um, uh, my first question is probably for Linda Irving. Um, I'm interested in the, uh, the calculation uh, of the number of parking uh, stalls that you've decided to include. It looks like there's a, um, I think a, a net increase of 52 stalls uh, for office tenants, I think. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I see you have 109 stalls for a lot of student apartments. Uh, um, and that seems appropriate, but I'm curious uh, in particular why you increased the parking for office uh, tenants. Um, what increase are you speaking to from what date to what date? Uh, maybe I'm not picking up. I'm sorry, mind. from the current situation until your proposal. It seems like I, I, I it seemed to me, I mean, maybe I've uh, not understood the calculation, but you have more commercial parking uh, available in the proposal than is currently on the lot. In the, on the surface lot, okay. Um, I cannot speak to uh, the exact count of the surface parking today. I do know that, um, I know what the 1998 uh, PD allowed the Alexander Company to go up to 340 spaces in total. Um, and here we are 20 years later and we are only proposing four more beyond what the PD allowed. Um, we do have a commitment with our partners, the Alexander Company, to provide them 235 spaces as part of this transaction for the land to not only supplement and solve to their current parking needs, but also uh, to address any future parking needs. So we, we have, we've kind of maxed out what is possible on this site to solve to the Cole Center, the Hilton Garden Inn, the two office buildings and future office building needs. Again, uh, limiting our residential uh, needs to 109. Did that answer your question? I, I apologize. I can't speak to the exact count on the surface lot. I should have had that number handy. Uh, it partially does, but you're, you're hinting at future redevelopment um, on the rest of the properties there that could provide demand in the parking structure. 
I think there, I think there's always a possibility of that. However, I, I, I cannot speak to that. I would let the Alexander company respond. We are just being, I believe both parties are being proactive for that future potential condition. Um, and, and I can let Joe or Adam speak to anything that the Alexander company might envision that, um, you know, plans for that future condition. Okay. Thank you. I, I can, I can imagine that, uh, uh, this may not not be for you, Linda. I'm not sure who can answer this, but uh, I'm interested in the the bike parking facility. And I, I watched the recording of the UDC meeting, and I I still have some concerns about access to that second floor bike storage area. And you know, there uh, it may have been uh, uh, Brady that show a slide of access to that. And it, I mean, I'm somebody who rides down that path every day. I probably won't be going in this building, but with 473 bike stalls using a little ramp that looks a little bit awkward. And uh, it, it seems also it will be very competitive. Uh, um, I, 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 I think this came up at UDC and there was discussion of a ramp perhaps, but that I understood that that would take up too much room if it was substantial, but I hope you'll consider some options to widen that ramp or do something to provide more access. Well, th thank you for bringing that up again. Um, and, and I was actually corrected by my architects on that meeting. Uh, there is a, a section of the stair on the right-hand side that is actually for wheeling the the, the bike up. As you're going up the stair, it, you're allowed to bring the, the bike with you as you go up that ramp. Um, however, you know, there was a, the steering committee had also suggested maybe we widen that a little bit and add a railing to that right-hand side. I think we're absolutely amenable to that. Uh, don't have any major concern about that kind of modification. Additionally, I mean, the residents can get out of this uh, bike parking zones on each of the floors in a number of ways. This is likely going to be the most popular, but um, we have they they can bring their 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 bikes down any one of the uh, elevators to the ground floor level. This is just the most popular. Again, it, this is likely going to be the path they would want to take on, on a more regular basis. Yeah, I, thank you. Yeah, I, we would get to a stipulation if you wanted to see a little bit more expand there. Okay, thanks. I yeah, I just am picturing 473 students and bicycles going not just up but also down mm -hmm. uh, that little ramp and and feeling like it's kind of insufficient. But I'll I'll mull that over. Um, those are my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Uh, Commissioner Fernandez. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I have a number of questions. Um, I'm not a certain who's the best person to answer them, but let me let me just uh, give you a preview of the questions. I'm mainly concerned about the interface between the path and uh, and your plaza. Um, the first one uh, involves safety. Uh, when we design a bike path and just full disclosure i was the city's bike path designer for about 17 or 18 years and i also designed that particular path um, we have a clear area of about three feet uh, on either side in other words if the path is say 11 feet wide uh, there needs to be a three foot clear area beyond that so you're now going to wind up with uh, 11 plus six you know something like that uh, we can't we can't have an obstruction, including a curb or a tree or anything else, within three feet of the path. That's an important safety consideration, and it's enshrined in the Ashto manual and et cetera. Um, the other concern that I have is um, vehicular encroachment, especially with the um, uh, vehicular access off of uh, Regent Street possibly limited. Uh, I'm concerned that this could become a really important move-in, move-out place. We've had quite a few problems along the path where on those days, suddenly moving trucks feel that that path is the driveway up to the, up to the building. Um, and I would argue strongly for uh, physical separation, bollards, something that makes it absolutely impossible for a vehicle 
to enter the site from the bike path. Um, so that's question number two. Um, and the third one is has to do with reconstructability of the path. Okay, that path was built. It won't last forever. At some point, the um, city is going to have to move in there with forces. And when you rebuild a 12-foot-wide pavement, you need more than 12 feet to do it in. In other words, if, it, if right up against the path is um, high-quality pavers or something like that, uh, they're going to be destroyed in the process of moving it. So my question involving that is that with regard to that city property, if the city needed to, uh, for a bit, want of a better word, destroy some of those improvements in order to reconstruct the path, would that be entirely um, not at the city's expense? In other words, the city, because that city property, the agreement would, would uh, require the development to replace those improvements at their own expense. Um, I suppose those are my three major questions. Okay. okay. Let's Linda, see. can you either answer that or indicate who of your team would be appropriate to answer those? I, th I think I can answer it and then I'll defer if I need to. So uh, speaking about the, I think we're talking about access to the bike path and the potential of um, wanting a clear zone. I think currently, for example, you have car stops um, that are within that clear path that is your desired uh, future condition. But um, I, I think we are amenable to city staff's direction as it relates to what planters or elevated elements they would expect or not expect. We've demonstrated that layering of landscaping, trying to respond to a lot of the aesthetic uh, elements and feedback we've been getting. Um, but if we're just talking about a small curb that just separates the landscape plantings and, and the green space so that it doesn't spill over into the bike path, I think, again, we're not necessarily dictating what that height of that planter needs to be. We are be trying to be responsive to what folks uh, would uh, uh, find visually appealing along there. We also worked with the, the, I believe it's a DAT meeting back in December where, you know, there were some conversations about the number of access points for safety reasons from our little greenway to the bike path. Originally, it had a lot more hardscape and opportunity for kind of an intercept at the bike path. So where we landed with our two connections, I believe the city felt fairly comfortable. And I, I'm, I'm possibly speaking for that team and I guess Colin could chime in, but we've landed at two very intentional connections to the bike path for that public safety element that you're talking about as far as the intercept with the individual. Uh, but again, whether or not the planters need to be be raised or just be an edge condition, again, I think we are, are willing to work with you know parties to find out what is the best solution for that stretch. On your second note, the move in, move out experience, I believe I have that correct. That was your second comment. Yes. Um, so we have provided a complete operations plan that's been uploaded to the website. Um, I, I believe in there we speak to the time frame of which that occurs, but um, to to dive in just a little further, the majority of the residents that we anticipate uh, finding this, this particular property highly appealing are the ones that we, we bring them in on the scheduled move dates, likely two days a year in August. It's a highly sequenced element. Uh, we have cones. We have uh, very specific instructions on how that occurs. And because we're a developer that provides furnishings, there is very little truck uh, usage at all on those days. It is usually the resident and their family members emptying out the trunk of their car and walking their items in through the front door. However, this particular project has also, we have the luxury of having that secondary um, elevator that can be also used for the move in, move out process. It's a very highly sequenced event that has hour by hour uh, folks on staff that are checking people in that they're scheduled at your certain time. 
um, and it's scheduled over two days to prevent a, a traffic nightmare. Uh, we also did file a TDMP plan as part of this project, excuse me, a traffic impact analysis as part of this project. And that's one of the factors I believe that plays into it is, is what is your you know, impact on the vehicular movements around the building. So very comfortable with that being non-impactful as it relates to the food truck zone of the site, we do have some bollards shown, which I think is, is very important currently to have that opportunity to break up that zone with the concern about food trucks and possibly the curb. Um, we And I do not, I'll have to defer to my architects because I'm not looking at it on my screen right now. I believe there are also bollards at the western end of the drive. Um, and I have to defer to one of my architects to verify that since I'm not looking at the schematics. Um, but I, and I apologize, your third question was? Um, it was the repair of the bike path? Uh, yes, sorry. Of the so, Yes, I'm currently working with Jenny Freeze of the city. So um, we have a city lease and we're working on the language as it speaks. At any point in the future, not just related to landscaping, at any point in the future, if the city chooses to take back that land or do additional repairs or work, um, we have to be prepared that Anything that we construct must be removed. That's just a condition in the lease. We're even looking at that set of stairs as making sure that in the event that that, that condition were ever to happen, the stairs could be removed and we have a finished facade on that elevation. Um, so there's some contingency plans put in place on that. And I believe the city lease actually addresses any language about repairs that would take place in that zone that could impact my landscaping. Yeah, thank you. I think I have um, two two follow ups. Okay. First of all, um, you know, for uh, as an engineer on that path, what I would be looking for uh, is a cross section view that says this is how wide the path is. This is where the curb is located. This is where the this is where the shoulder is located. This is where the the nearest obstruction is located. I, I can't read that from your plans. I, I can't get that. How would I go about um, assuring myself as an engineer uh, who spent a lot of time ensuring the safety that regardless of where the curb stops were located, uh, that may not represent the condition that we want there on a permanent basis. So that doesn't uh, ease my mind. Um, so I, I would appreciate at some point some sort of a cross-sectional view uh, that would allow, uh, you know, a transportation engineer to really evaluate the safety of that cross-section going through there. So I, I'll probably make that as a some kind of an amendment or a condition to this. And the the second question is with regard to move-in. If I understand you correctly, um, you are saying that for two days of the year. Uh, you will shut down the path. You you will you will uh, manage, but permit vehicular access onto the path and probably mm, block the path. In, in some way, you will utilize the path as as your move in, move out um, space. Is that correct? And has traffic engineering weighed in on that uh, condition? No, actually, I have completely misled them. Oh. If that's how it came across, the path is is. Off, off limits. Oh. The, the move in, move out would take place on the internal drives. And if you noticed at near our entrance, we have the ability to actually have kind of a, a turnaround court. That mm -hmm. is where I am at. And because of the size of this project, I can envision we probably would have two sequences, but both of them take place off the internal drive. Right. Um, the, the path is the path and our landscaping, that, that is all just you know, we, we are very clear on, on not being able to bring a vehicle under the path. It would okay. be quite a restriction. Yeah. Okay. I really appreciate that. I misunderstood. No I misunderstood and I'm, I'm very uh, pleased with that answer. I think that uh, that resolves my questions at this time. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, our next uh, Commissioner Shepard, do you have questions? Yes, uh, one question in particular uh, dealing with um, the issue of snow management that in the staff report, 
on page eight, I think condition one, there's actually a note in there saying once again, that uh, there should be a, a property management plan for a number of different things. And one thing that's listed there is snow management. I looked in the uh, property management plan that was included in our packet. Um, and I read through that and it addresses a number of things, but maybe I missed it, but I didn't see anything in there about snow management. The reason I bring that up is because this is a it's a large property on a very limited site. Um, in particular, the north side next to, once again, the um, commuter path. So could you talk, someone from the team, talk a little bit about, again, is there a snow management uh, plan? Um, and also, how, do you, how will you manage the snow? Uh, because again, all of the illustrations show bright, sunny days, but you know, this is Madison, <laughs> just like Chicago. And yep. it, it, it isn't always pretty. So, so Linda, can you handle that? If not, to indicate who of your team would be appropriate. I, I can too. Okay. <laughs> my, my, my role, my role tends to cover a lot of territory. So um, we have a reciprocal operating easement agreement with the Alexander Company. They are the property manager, so to speak, for the common drives. Uh, that actually came up in a conversation. Our property manager has already wet the, met with the Alexander Company kind of at a high level, and we're currently working on all that language. But it's a common area of maintenance process that will be in place. And currently, the Alexander Company has snow removal uh, for all of those properties. Now, we did talk about it's going to get a little tight. And we're going to have to really micro where the snow will get moved to once this building sits in its final destination. But we're we're not only talking about it in the permanent condition, but we have a contractor that's been working with us on a logistics plan. And that's also part of our very detailed conversation about how and where to move the snow to in the, in the snow events. Um, but again, Alexander Company is ultimately our property overseer for all of these uh, endeavors. Uh, we will just be paying our, our proportionate share as it relates to that element. Um, I can defer to the Alexander Company on this call if you'd like further detail on how they handle it currently. I, I don't necessarily need details right now, but maybe something like that can be, in, I don't know, included in, in 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 the record somehow in terms of that there is there needs to be, I think, in the property management plan that's in the records that we receive, something there about snow management, because that sure. is listed in the staff report as a condition um, and that should be included. That that will not be a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, Commissioner Shepherd? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Commissioner Spencer. Thank you. I just had a question for, I think, Robert. Uh, Robert, you had shown a slide and said that um, going from Regent Street to the site would be um, pedestrian friendly. And I was just wondering if you had more details on um, that sort of pedestrian and bicycling experience from Regent uh, to the site, the road looks a little bit tight in there. And just wondering if you had more uh, details or comments about that. Robert, the question was directed to you. Um, yeah, I can I can answer and uh, Linda may want to weigh in as well. Uh, there are two slides in our deck that referred to that slide nine and slide 10. The uh, different vehicular and pedestrian circulation elements are defined on slide nine with different dashed lines. Uh, mm -hmm. Where you see the blue dashed lines are sidewalks that are directly dedicated to the pedestrians uh, accessing our building from Regent Street, also from the bike path. You can see through ways where those cross vehicular traffic areas, there would be a designated zone uh, where there, it's a differentiated pavement, pavement pattern or something of, of akin to that to, to create a direct, uh, consistent route from Regent Street back in. The, um, the red on that is our vehicle traffic. And as you can see, this, this actually also speaks to the move-in question. There's a loop at the end of the drive as opposed to anyone uh, any vehicles going in onto the bike path, so that's completely segregated. And the cyan color is 
for uh, the bicycle traffic. So we've got, as Linda pointed out previously, two access points to that, to our uh, front plaza. Um, I think that that's what I have to say about that. Okay. Did that answer your questions, Commissioner Spencer? It does, thank you. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, did you have any other questions, Commissioner Spencer? I don't right now, thanks. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Cantrell. Yes, I have a question about parking again. And um, overall, there's 344 parking spaces and 109 for the, for the apartments. Uh, will the parking be separated, uh, separating the office uh, parkers from the, the um, residential uh, units parking area? Another great question. So we have already uh, presented a draft of where that separation would take place to the Alexander Company. And in the next uh, couple of weeks, we will fine tune that in our legal documents. But there will be a control arm or gate, so to speak, that exists at the break point between the spaces that are open for all the other uses and where our resident will enter to their dedicated zone, which is the top floor and a half. Um, they would either have a transponder on their dashboard or uh, a fob of some sort that would raise the gate to their private uh, parking zone. And we're also working through the language in the documents with Alexander Company about, you know, the monitoring and the control of the garage, safety, security, and all that. Okay. Um, another question. I, I, I live near this site, so I, I walk around, um, use a bike path and the uh, by walking in and riding a bike and and um, go to Panera and the very close uh, uses there. Uh, I uh, In driving around today, the, the parking lot uh, is maybe 50% occupied. Um, and I understand that with COVID, there's probably a lot of people working at home and those sorts of things. But um, And you have a lot of apartments and maybe a more need for parking for the apartments even though you know, I understand it's going to be students and and uh, a lot of them use bike bikes and that sort of thing. But but uh, what if someone wanted to? What if all the 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 uh, parking for the apartments were uh, leased up? Uh, is there an opportunity for some of those apartment users to uh, lease uh, some of the office spaces, which will likely be un uh, unoccupied? Um, well, I'd have to defer to my Alexander company friends on this call uh, because I, I'm sure we will do whatever works best for both parties. Um, our marketing strategy is uh, to, we also feel confident about our parking ratio at this particular property. It's similar to another one and another tower I did uh, in Arizona where the parking ratio uh, was low for the number of students. Um, but we also work, we have a, an entire kind of slide deck presentation internally with our property management folks that speaks to all of the off-site parking options that can be presented as part of the leasing conversation. And also there is the uh, opportunity for off-site uh, vehicle storage. For example, I live in Chicago. I keep my vehicle in storage because uh, it's such a pedestrian uh, friendly and, and public transportation friendly uh, opportunity. It, I don't need my vehicle on a regular basis. That's what our property management and leasing agents will be doing as part of that conversation when they are uh, going through the lease up process in our building. Um, and, and, you know, I, I again, I would let my Alexander company uh, partners on this call speak to whether or not they'd be amenable to any other, you know, lease arrangement if for some reason their demand went down and ours went up. Thank you, Linda. Uh, it Adam Winkler or Joe Alexander, do you want to respond? Yeah, thank you, Liddell. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I can actually hit both Commissioner Cantrell and Commissioner Hex questions about parking. They're similar. Um, it is correct that there will be more parking spaces, slightly more parking spaces dedicated to the two office buildings whose parking is being displaced. Some of that is because, frankly, we're overparked today, which is a strategy a lot of people use. Um, and because if, if you all look at the downtown plan, um, you will see that the Trinitas building basically is pictured and the future of the rail corridor is showing 
um, six to eight story buildings along Regent Street. And that's how we see it as well. We hope that vehicular um, parking is less important in the future. And this actually reflects that we can add that density and have less parking per square foot than we have now. Um, the other point I'd hit is you're right. Uh, our tenants have not fully returned from working at home, although I'm happy to say that almost all of them have plans to. Um, so it's good to have people back at work. <laughs> it will create some, some parking congestion. Um, and I think, I think that covers Commissioner Cantrell's question. Oh, I guess the other thing is, um, sure, if we have surge space and folks are willing to pay for parking spaces, um, absolutely, we'd entertain that if we've got the spots. Okay. Thank, um, you. thank, thank you. That, that answers my questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Alder Heck. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad I got my first question of Joe Alexander answered that that was helpful. Um, just a question for Linda. I think you mentioned access control to the commercial parking component. I assume there'll be access control to the student portion to or residential portion. And also, um, I just wanted to make sure that the parking fees were uncoupled from rents in the residential component. They are, in fact, you can choose to rent without taking a parking space. Um, first come, first serve on uh, leasing them, though. Uh, and you were right, is it is a controlled access to the residential portion. Okay, thank you. That was my question. Uh-huh. Thank you. Are there any further questions of any of our registrants? Any further questions of our registrants? Seeing no raised hands, I'll close the public hearing. Are there questions of staff? Commissioner Fernandez. Thanks, so um, my question for staff is, you know, I, I remain concerned that the uh, that the cross section has not been properly looked at from a safety standpoint, and and uh, and also that the issue of preventing vehicular encroachment there has not been completely addressed. Is there a way? How how would I address that with regard to this? I don't necessarily want to create an amendment, but would would I say uh, ask a condition that says something like subject to um, uh, a cross section being reviewed by traffic engineering for safety purposes, or how how would you how would I address those concerns without throwing a monkey wrench into this uh, process? So, Colin, do you want to address that? Yeah, thank you. Um, I I think it's it's definitely um, within your purview to uh, request a uh, a cross section uh, for traffic engineers review. Um, as well as um, an exhibit uh, showing um, traffic control measures uh, to prevent vehicles from from accessing the path, uh, whether those are curbs or, or bollards or, or things like that. Um, I think either both of those are, are probably fair game at this point. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Colin. Anything else, Commissioner Fernandez? No. Uh, no, that's that's fine for me. Thank you. Okay, good, thank you. Alder Heck. Thank you, in the same vein, uh, I'll ask Colin about uh, my concerns about the, uh, the ramp going up and down to the bicycle storage area. And if you, um, you know, like Commissioner Fernandez, I, I don't wanna throw a big monkey wrench in this and, and the, the, the development team expressed interest in trying to work something out. Um, uh, including this, perhaps the suggestion of the Campus Area Neighborhood Association about uh, a, a railing on the, the interior side of that ramp. And I'm, I'm mostly concerned about capacity um, and that it's, you know, it's, it's for some folks, that, uh, even 20 year olds, uh, it's not as easy as you would think to go up and down those ramps. Uh, they're, 
those ramps exist on an apartment building adjacent to where I live. And I, I have seen people struggle with them a little bit. Um, do you have any suggestions about uh, some sort of analogous uh, request for, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, I don't want to dictate how wide the ramp is or that there needs to be a ramp on both sides and up and down ramp. Uh, do you have any suggestions? Um, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, I think, uh, it, less, less of a suggestion about additional facilities is, you know, an, an additional exhibit showing the, the ways, um, that the bike parking can be accessed. So up that, that ramp stair combination, um, if there is a, uh, a an elevator, um, and then kind of the internal ramping, um, in the parking garage, um, the, the, the entrances from the Regent street side, um, just so we can be assured that there are multiple ways in and out, uh, of that, that parking area. Um, I, I think it would be probably helpful to, to have a, a wider ramp. Um, and, and if they are able to, uh, kind of adjust the, the rise and run of those stairs and the the slope of that ramp, um, that may be something that that we could request that they explore as well. Okay, that that's food for thought. Thanks. Those are that was my question. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Solheim. Thank you. Um, I have two quick questions related to actually the the UDC report. As so I was going through it. Um, I just want to make sure I was understanding the balcony situation. So it seemed like some of the balconies, are they encroaching over the, the city area? So some of those may be pulled off and that's one of the things that UDC is reviewing again. I, I just wanted to clarify that. Yes, that is correct. The, um, the terms of the lease that, that um, Linda had spoken about is that there, there cannot be real, real permanent uh, structures um, mm -hmm. either mm -hmm. in or overhanging the, um, the, the city parcel. And so okay. any overhanging balconies have to be removed. Okay. And one other question, um, you know, I know that uh, since we've moved virtual, a lot of, a lot of that stuff is, is kind of still, still in place. So in terms of materials, um, are UDC members actually getting any um, materials in hand like they used to? I'm just seeing, you know, this is obviously a very large building. I think the materials look nice. There's a lot of metal paneling. I'm just curious if that is an actual material that someone was able to, to see in hand. Um, and generally for, for other projects, I just, I've seen a lot of the, still the, you know, visual exhibits, but I know that we used to have to provide material samples. I, I know that some um, proposals still have, but it's. I think it's the rarity now. I okay. think um, I'm, I'm not sure if this one, uh, if UDC has seen. It looks like Heather might have a have a better answer. Heather, I don't think it's better. I, I just just one nuance. I think um, what's more typical now is to send a PDF that's actually a photo of the actual material board, so that you can get mm -hmm. some sense of depth. Um, finish, et cetera. But to my knowledge, no one is actually submitting the actual materials for distribution um, to mm -hmm. Urban Design Commission members, but it's more than just the renderings and elevations. Okay, that's helpful. And I know that um, from experience that UDC knows their paneling very well, and they always ask about that. So I feel comfortable with their review for sure. All right, that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there other questions of staff? Other questions of staff? Seeing no raised hands, I would be looking for a motion. Commissioner Cantrell. Um, just one Sorry. second, sure. Commissioner. Um, Alder Revere, did you wish to speak before the motion or after? Thank you, Chairperson Zellers. I, I have no preference. I'm happy to share my comments with the commission now or, or after the vice chair's motion. Since you've got the floor, why don't you go ahead and speak? 
Very good. Thank you. Thank you again, Chair Chair Zellers. Uh, and and I, I as always appreciate the the hard work that you and your fellow commissioners uh, put into this volunteer position day in and day out. Uh, I, I want to share with all of you as the alder of the district where this application is located uh, that I do support the proposal. Uh, I I do I do believe that although the proposal is is not perfect, perhaps some would say. Um, deficient in, in some regards, and I'll get into that in a moment. Uh, I do believe that the plan development standards uh, are, are met here and, and support the amended uh, PD, GDP, SIP, and the related uh, certified survey map uh, that's before you tonight. Um, <clears throat> first, let me say what, what I think is the most exciting about this, and, and that is to state the obvious. And that is that this is a vastly underutilized site uh, in, in such a prime uh, area of, of uh, our community, uh, the downtown. Uh, the, the fact that we are replacing a large surface parking lot, a parking lot that's, that's been there you know, since the 1990s uh, with such a higher and better land use, I think is undeniable. Uh, I, I do think, although at first glance, it might not be seen as appropriate to some reasonable people, but I do believe um, that if you thought about this long and hard, any reasonable person would say that, yes, this is an appropriate location for almost 700 residents that will almost entirely uh, be made up of, of university students. Uh, and, I, and I say that for primarily because of its location, its proximity. Uh, although, although not facing a traditional street, the fact that this is facing a multi-use path, uh, I, I think is just fine. The reason why I, I think the location is appropriate for student housing, of course, is because of its close adjacency to campus, literally right across the railroad tracks and the Southwest commuter uh, path uh, from UW lands. Um, namely the, the Cole Center and the NIC, formerly the SURF. Uh, East Campus Mall, as I'm sure the commissioners are all well aware, is a very well-traveled path for university students and other members of the UW community. Uh, so I, I think convenient access to campus uh, is, is readily at hand, although it might not seem as, as much literally because this is on the other side of the railroad tracks. Uh, the... The concerns that I have, I'll just cut to that chase immediately here. The concerns that I have uh, are echoed in the Campus Area Neighborhood Association Steering Committee's uh, statement that, that you all received this afternoon. Uh, and, and that largely relates to affordability. I, I know that perhaps for some, uh, it might seem like a broken record, but uh, it is increasingly apparent, I think, to all policymakers in City Hall and most members of our community that we have a severe lack of affordable housing in our community and that extends to the student community as well. Uh, I know older person Hack is vastly aware of this and has worked uh, in this regard and, and uh, other council colleagues have as well. Um, so, uh, you know, the development team, the applicants have been challenged time and time again uh, in the neighborhood steering committee meetings, which I greatly appreciate the team participating willingly in on many occasions, uh, as well as in the large publicly uh, noticed meeting we had back on January 31st. And, and actually, as I think about it, the introductions they made to Canna and the Mifflin District of Capital Neighborhoods uh, early in the year uh, on the issue of affordability. Um, the applicant's response that this is located in Tax Incremental District 48 uh, so-called kind of triangle uh, district, uh, I, I think, uh, is merited, and and it absolutely is, is is true that if this development is approved and built, it will provide a tremendous uh, amount of of increment uh, to the relatively recently created TID forty eight, including to provide opportunities elsewhere for affordable housing, and I greatly appreciate that. And and uh, and uh, um, you know very much uh, uh, concur uh, that that will be the case, uh, but but it is it is disappointing that that you know more often than not the response from and I don't mean to just beat up on this applicant but most applicants 
uh, is that they're market rate developers and that's all we do. Uh, I, I will share that I'm excited that there are at least two affordable housing uh, proposals that have recently um, been brought to my attention in the core downtown area over the last few weeks. So that's that's something that uh, I very much look forward to discussing with this commission uh, at the appropriate times in the future. Uh, the other concern uh, relating to this application beyond the affordability or lack thereof is activation of first of the first floor. Uh, I recall when I first met uh, the development team and specifically Linda Irving about five months ago, last October, uh, in our very first meeting, uh, we discussed how critical it was that, that this proposal uh, be well oriented to the Southwest commuter path. Uh, and I remember sharing with her uh, and other members of the development team at that first meeting and in subsequent conversations, uh, the experience that I remember when, when this commission and the Urban Design Commission considered the uh, Mortensen Development Hilton Garden Inn uh, amended SIP application back in 2019 and how important it was to UDC and to this commission that the development be well oriented to the Southwest commuter path. Uh, and and uh, obviously this applicant has heard that time and time again uh, in the various conversations with city staff, with the neighborhood, with myself, with, with, with uh, the neighborhood steering committee um, conversations. And I do believe, and they deserve credit for the design progression uh, the, since their original very kind of crude uh, uh, design that they shared with me back in October. They absolutely have improved this design uh, substantially, um, particularly how critical it is um, for the walkability and, and that it be oriented to the multi-use path and, and, uh, and most specifically the activation of the first floor. With all that said, it, it still, you know, I, you know, it isn't where I wish it was in a perfect world. Uh, as the alders uh, on the commission know, uh, uh, I just came from a uh, closed session conversation we had at the city finance committee regarding redevelopment of our Lake Street parking garage uh, and related um, private development uh, above a new garage there on North Lake Street. And similarly, we had the challenge uh, with that request for proposals that the Finance Committee was considering in closed session as to how to deal with the design uh, of uh, housing uh, and, and a public parking uh, garage uh, and, and how would it specifically be screened and the perforated screen here that you have that you have before you tonight, including on the first floor, uh, is not something that that was uh, amongst the, the the proposals that that were considered uh, for Lake Street because it just is relatively poor urban design, to be sure. Uh, although I do want to give credit where credits due, the development team and their designers have made strides in this regard, but I, I still wish it, it was a, a better design in terms of activation of the first floor uh, and, and the screening of, of the uh, garage behind it. Um, as, as it relates to a couple of other areas quickly, I Again, uh, because I was in that city finance committee meeting, I missed the entirety of the public hearing for this item and the staff uh, introduction of this item. I, I did tune in when, when uh, Ms. Irving was, was uh, responding to questions. And, and so in that regard, I don't know if this was shared with the commission or not, but I do wanna share with the commission something that, that you Chairperson Zellers certainly is aware of, and that is the efforts of the city planning staff uh, to work toward a uniform management plan for these sorts of uh, at least large um, student-oriented multifamily buildings. So I, if that was not communicated to all of you, I just want to share that that is something that, that the chairperson and I have been in, in meetings with planning staff about. And so what you have before you in the staff report is the new model management plan condition. Uh, and, and so if any of you have feedback in that regard, I, I appreciate perhaps hearing it tonight, if not in the future. Uh, I appreciate Commissioner Shepard's question about snow removal and so forth. I want to acknowledge that the kind of draft management plan that's in your materials tonight in the packet 
uh, is not what I consider to be their final management plan that would be uh, responsive to the proposed staff condition regarding a comprehensive management plan. Uh, I, I think it beyond just snow removal, I, I think it needs to, to be uh, more comprehensive in many respects. Um, the Campus Area Neighborhood Association Steering Committee statement gives some specifics in that regard that, that are not specifically called out in the staff proposed condition. But rather than get into amending that condition, I do think that it broadly is responsive to all of the, the neighborhood associations specific concerns in this regard. So I'm not proposing uh, that that condition be necessarily amended tonight. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Commissioner Fernandez's excellent questions relating to the Southwest commuter path. Uh, I certainly remember Tony full well that you were the designer of what we called then the missing link. Uh, and and I think it's it's uh, very helpful that you're that you're um, asking these questions tonight, and and I would wholeheartedly support uh, additional conditions relating to uh, Commissioner Fernandez's uh, I think well placed um, questions uh, and concerns relating to the future uh, uses of the Southwest commuter path. Uh, in, in summary, though, I, I, I do believe, as I said, that the PD standards are met here and do support uh, the amended SIP and the, and the CSM. So although not perfect, uh, I do urge your support for this tonight. I want to recognize the Urban Design Commission's fine work, and I'm comfortable with the staff proposed conditions relating to uh, the outstanding issues that, that the applicants need to return to UDC to secure final approval. Uh, I think those each and every one of those are very important. I understand the landscape architect presented tonight. Again, I missed that their testimony uh, because I was in another meeting, but but that that of course uh, needed clearly to be addressed and significant improvement from the initial UDC uh, meeting. Um, but but anyway, uh, so I, I I do support all of the various conditions as proposed by staff in the report and appreciate the development team's willingness to work with the neighborhood. And lastly, we want to thank, as always, uh, the volunteers uh, of the both the Campus Area Neighborhood Association and Capital Neighborhoods for their excellent work working jointly together on the steering committee report that you all received today. And, and thank those folks, especially Eli and Cleo, uh, for their hard work on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alder Verbeer. Uh, we will move back now to Commissioner Cantrell for a motion. Okay. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good. Thanks. Uh, I will uh, recommend that our, I will recommend that the plan commission find that the standards for the plan uh, developments are met, and that uh, the uh, zoning uh, uh, ordinance amendment for uh, 740 Regent Street from plan development, general development plan, specific implementation plan, uh, be amended um, to the PDGDP SIP and that the uh, related certified survey map be forwarded to the Common Council with a recommendation of approval. Uh, and I will add a couple of amendments which um, have been discussed and and uh, if, if these are not adequate, I would uh, uh, suggest that the uh, uh, commission uh, uh, adjust them. But uh, the first one will be that the developer provide a cross section for the bike trail uh, for review and approval uh, by the uh, city traffic engineer. And the, the uh, second one uh, is that uh, staff work with the developer to widen the bike ramp into the bike parking area and indicate other options for access in and out of the bike parking area. And again, if um, these need to be adjusted, I would suggest that the commission commissioners that are interested in those do so. Uh, and I'm uh, I'll be uh, uh, up for any type of friendly amendments to this uh, motion. Thank you, Commissioner Cantrell. Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Solheim. Commissioner Cantrell, did you wish to speak to your motion? Yes, uh, I think 
Uh, this provides housing, obviously, that uh, the city needs, and also uh, density where we, we uh, need it as well. And uh, it, it provides housing in an underutilized parking area. Uh, I think this is a very appropriate site uh, for this development. And uh, I think the project has done a, a good job of, of uh, relating uh, to the uh, uh, com commuter uh, bike uh, path that it adjoins. Uh, so I, I, I think it's a very exciting project for this area. And I, that's why I'm recommending it be approved. Thank you, Commissioner. Are there comments, discussion? Uh, Heather, did you have something you wanted to? Just uh, thank you, Chair Zeller. There's one very small thing, and it has to do with the bike access along the stair stairway. Um, Perhaps if that could be a little bit more open to either widen or create a second ramp um, of similar width, I think then you'd get the comings and goings handled maybe even better. So I just wanted to uh, encourage the commission to maybe open that up a little bit. Um, Commissioner Cantrell, did you wanna maybe? That, that would be obviously fine with me uh, if it's appropriate uh, with the other uh, commission members. If I'm seeing shaking hands, uh, heads, <laughs> so um, I think that clarification um, is good because it's the access that uh, that we're after. So good. Okay, Commissioner Fernandez. Thank you, Chair Zellers. Uh, I very much appreciate the the motion, including the amendment. Um, and I would like to offer uh, a very small additional amendment that the applicant. Uh, submit a detail of the plaza area indicating um, for approval by traffic engineering indicating how um, vehicular encroachment from the path will be uh, prohibited. Okay, I'll take that as a, a motion. Do we have a second to that for that amendment? Uh, Commissioner Cantrell seconds. Uh, so we will vote on that amendment. Are there any uh, comments or about the amendment? Seeing none, we will come to a vote and I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, that's now part of the main motion. Um, are there other comments, discussion points? Seeing no raised hands, we will come to a vote and I will assume unanimous consent on the motion unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is uh, agenda item seven, Legistar 68200, located at 6831 Odana Road, 19th Alder District, consideration of a conditional use in the Commercial Center District for a vehicle access sales and service window, and consideration of a conditional use in the Commercial Center District for a major alteration to a planned multi-use site containing more than 40,000 square feet of floor area and where 25,000 square feet of floor area is designed or intended for retail use to allow construction of a one-story restaurant with vehicle access sales and service window. Um, and we will have uh, a staff presentation by Colin Punt. Colin. Yes, thank you again. Um, next up is uh, the request for a drive through at a fast food restaurant uh, within a planned multi use site at 6831 Odana Road. Uh, as, uh, as part of the due consideration of adopted plan, staff uh, has noted that this proposal is inconsistent with some aspects of the recently adopted Odana area plan, um, most notably the two story height recommendation in the design elements appendix and uh, the specific setback recommendations. 
while uh, there have been several proposed single story buildings um, that have been approved in areas recommended for uh, regional mixed use in the comprehensive plan, uh, which was adopted in 2018, uh, this is the first such proposal that the commission will be reviewing against the more detailed recommendations in the Odana area plan. Uh, in addition to the height considerations, the Odana area plan uh, also recommends uh, that for new buildings fronting on the commercial core areas, which includes the frontage of the, the 6800 block, um, that they be oriented to maximize pedestrian transit and bicycle use while shielding parking from the public realm. Uh, staff does note that um, there are some issues with conditional use standards of approval four and five, uh, but we believe that uh, the commission can find uh, those two uh, standards met. Uh, staff do have some greater concern with standard nine uh, in relation to the Odana area plan recommendations, um, as are detailed in the staff report. Uh, if the commission does find that standard uh, nine is met, um, staff does rec recommend that the commission approve the request. Uh, but if the commission cannot find that standard nine is met, um, that it places the request on file without prejudice. And I will uh, be available to answer questions. Thank you, Colin. We do have some registrants for this item. I will open the public hearing. We will first hear from Lauren Downing. Zenith Parkway, Loves Park, Illinois, in support and wishing to speak. And I believe that Lauren is the developer, but Lauren, if you could uh, clarify, and you do have three minutes. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so I'm Lauren Downing with Arc Design Resources. Uh, we're the civil engineer, and I was just gonna run through the site plan changes and elevation changes that occurred. Um, on this development through the UDC process. Um, so I guess, uh, Colin, do you have the presentation? Great, thank you so much. Uh, next slide. As Colin mentioned, uh, we're located at 6831 Odana Road that's out in front of the Burlington Coat Factory and uh, adjacent to the existing uh, Burger King. Next slide. Uh, we are proposing to go in an existing outlot. It's currently um, pavement for uh, the Burlington and uh, other uh, developments to the south. Next slide. Um, in the first UDC meeting, uh, they had concerns with uh, patrons crossing the drive through um, large walls along Odana Road and the 180 degree turn, as well as the materials of the building. And then I'm going to walk you through the changes that were made. Next slide. Um, so this was the original development. As you can see, the drive through wraps all the way around the building. And we had a uh, pedestrian ramp out in front, uh, which just due to the grade changes resulted in large walls. Next slide. Uh, we've modified it to reduce crossings or reduce conflict points for pedestrians and vehicles. Uh, we've also added a sidewalk to the north side of the parking lot and a more direct stair uh, access to the front of the building. This was uh, seen to be the best possible solution. Next slide. Uh, the landscaping was updated and um, is considered in compliance. Um, next slide. The majority of the building is proposed to be uh, brick uh, on all sides. And then there's also some uh, wood um, accents. Next slide. Uh, so here you can again see the mostly white brick uh, as well with the wood accent on the side. Next slide. And again, um, and final, or sorry, you can go to the next slide. So this is again, just running through the building. Uh, previously, a uh, large amount of the white area was uh, EFIS and has been updated to brick. Next slide. And again, you can see the now mostly uh, brick walls, both white and red brick. Next slide. Here again with the accent um, wood features, simulated wood features. Next slide. And finally, the rear of the building is also all brick. And that's what I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next registrant is Ryan Swanson, Zenith Parkway, Loves Park, Illinois, support wishing to speak. Um, and I think also representing the developer. 
Uh, Ryan, you have three minutes. Uh, thank you. I don't have anything further to add. Uh, I think Lauren hit all the high points okay. of the changes in the development. Thank you, though. Great. Thank you. Um, and then the final uh, registrant wishing to speak is Dan O'Callaghan, West Washington Avenue, Madison and support wishing to speak, uh, representing Westland Plaza, LLC. Dan, you have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Dan O'Callaghan. I'm a land use attorney with the Carlson Black Law Firm uh, here in Madison, and I'm here tonight as part of the project team. Um, I'd like to focus my comments on the issue that was raised in the staff report. Um, the high level conclusion, as you heard in the staff report, is that on balance, staff believes it's possible for the commission to conclude that the standards can be met but calls out two areas uh, in particular where the proposal is inconsistent with the design guidelines in the recently adopted Odana area plan. And staff encourages the commission to examine those two points uh, before approving the project. Uh, we agree with staff that plan recommendations are very important, so we wanna address that issue head on. Uh, first, as the report notes, uh, the Odana area plan encourages new buildings to be a minimum of two stories in height, whereas the proposal in front of you is a one-story building. And second, the plan encourages buildings to be set back no more than five feet, uh, whereas the proposal in front of you shows a 30-foot setback. The report notes, and we agree, that inconsistencies with plan recommendations aren't fatal, but they need to be considered. In order to approve the request, notwithstanding those inconsistencies, uh, you must find that the proposal, and I'm sort of paraphrasing here, but you have to find that the proposal creates an environment of aesthetic compatibility with the existing or the intended character of the surrounding area. So when you look at that surrounding context, uh, which is the roughly three quarter mile stretch of Odana um, from Gammon on the west to Potomac Lane on the east, that's the area that's owned CC, you'll find there are 26 lots with frontage on Odana. And 25 of those are fully developed. Um, and the proposal in front of you is really the only vacant lot along that stretch. And of the existing 25 buildings, there's only one that's a two-story building. Um, and with regard to the setbacks, the existing setbacks along that stretch of Odana range from approximately 20 feet at the closest to about 220 feet, with the average being somewhere um, around 75 feet. So in light of that, we think that the proposed one-story building with a 30-foot setback is very compatible with the existing context, and the proposal um, that's before you satisfies the criteria. And in addition to the consistency with the existing context element, um, there are several practical reasons why the proposal doesn't follow all of the plan's recommendations. Um, and there's a, you know, an example that's called out in the staff report um, that this property in particular is subject to a private restrictive covenant as part of the shopping center development that requires a minimum 30-foot setback. And uh, you should note that notwithstanding those two inconsistencies that were called out, there are in fact a number of ways in which the proposal is consistent with the design recommendations that are contained in the plan, including the front facade um, and the articulation, um, the, the brick and the materials that uh, Lauren reviewed just a moment ago. Um, and finally, we want to note that the proposal in front of you is supported by traffic engineering and was recommended for approval by UDC. So all things considered, including the Odana area plan, we believe the current proposal satisfies the criteria and we ask for your approval. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, one more registrant, David Israel, Dundee Road, Northbrook, Illinois. Um, in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. It indicates he's not representing any organization. Um, are there questions of any of our registrants? Are there questions of any of the registrants? Alder Heck. Thank you. Uh, this is for Dan O'Callaghan. I'll, I'll probably ask the same question of staff, but I wanted to hear your inter interpretation again about the uh, deed restriction. The deed restriction in your mind is something that you must follow because of, of you know, it's it's in the, it's a private uh, restriction, but 
What's your interpretation of why the city should be interested in that if we're not party to that? That's a good question, Alder Heck. And I, certainly the city's not bound by that. Um, I, I mentioned that because we are subject to it. Uh, it's a private contract, essentially, um, that we have to comply with. Um, so if there was an ordinance that required um, a five-foot setback, um, we'd have to solve that problem on our own. We'd have to seek to have that setback uh, condition vacated or amended. Um, but here we've got a, a plan recommendation um, that suggests a five-foot setback um, but uh, requires consideration of the existing context. We think the context here, um, the, the plan we're proposing is consistent with the context. So uh, the covenant is something that, that the city's not required to follow, but it's important for us to explain why we're proposing what we are. We're at, we're at the minimum of what we can do. I see. Okay. Thanks for your explanation. Are there any other questions of any of the registrants? Seeing no raised hands, I will close. I will close the public hearing. Are there questions of staff? Are there questions of staff? Commissioner Fernandez. Uh, thank you, Chair Zellers. You know, I have a couple of questions of staff, um, but they're, they're kind of broad, and I wonder if it's best to wait for a, uh, a motion on this. But I, I guess I'll, as long as I, I'll go ahead and ask the questions. Right. But my, my overall impression is, is that, um, you know, if you were to build a one-story fast food drive through restaurant, the applicant has done about as good a job as you can do. I don't, I don't question that. But it would seem to me that beyond the technical uh, issues of five foot setback versus 30 or two story versus one story, that this type of business is completely uh, not in, in harmony with the intent of the plan. Um, it seems to me that it's probably quite in harmony with the existing conditions. But as I understand the Odana area plan, this feels very incongruous, not just slightly technically incongruous. Am I misled on that, or can you can you shed some light on that? And partly, partly, I'm asking about the the time frame because the Odana area plan feels long range, and that may be a long ways off. And this may actually be a very good interim use for this property, but it does not feel at all consistent with the long range intent of that plan. Um, so either Colin or Heather, Heather, it looks like. Heather? Sure. Thank you, Chair Zellers. Thank you, Commissioner Fernandez. Um, I'll start and then Colin may have more to add as well. I know we've been thinking long and hard about this one. So you're right. Uh, I think the proposal that's in front of the commission tonight isn't what is envisioned in the Odana area plan, but we must, you know, ensure that the focus is on the conditional use request that's being made and the conditional use standards. And so um, one of the things that we wrestled with as staff, to be honest, is that this isn't a conditional use request for a one story building. It has nothing to do with the height, uh, the, the request that's before you this evening. Um, it's a conditional use request for a drive through and for a new building in a multi-use site. And so trying to tie the specific conditional use standards to that in the existing uh, commercial center zoning district is really what the plan commission needs to focus on this evening. We um, definitely, uh, I, I think the plan and consistency here was important to bring up. It's a freshly adopted plan. We want to set the stage uh, for uh, the vision that that plan includes. And in some ways, um, it's difficult when smaller scale, short term development like this happens to, to imagine that larger evolution taking place. And so those are some of the things we grappled with, I think, as a staff team in reviewing this proposal. Um, I would say that um, 
some of the thing that we'll talk a little bit more about this on Thursday, um, something that's always an important next step after a plan is adopted is uh, a set of implementation measures like proactive rezonings, like um, transit oriented development overlay zoning, which we're pursuing. If there were uh, a zoning mechanism in place that would make it clearer that multiple stories were required here, I think it would be um, a non-issue. It would be a non-starter. But right now we don't have any of that zoning in place, whether it's a rezoning to the regional mixed use district um, or transit oriented development overlay that would require a two-story minimum. That's not there today. And so this is a, it's a gray area and that's why the report does read as it does. Uh, I think that, um, again, very important to, to bring up the inconsistency with regard to the building height, but I'm sure the commission will be weighing, um, you know, the idea of, well, if one, one additional story were added to this building, where would that be getting us? Um, you know, that question may be coming to mind as well. And so I, I don't think that that's been, that this has been the most helpful answer, but just wanted to talk through some of the things that we on the staff team have been grappling with uh, right around this issue. And I'll look at Colin now to see if he has anything he wants to add. No, let me let me just say for me, Heather, you completely answered my question. I feel very satisfied with that response. Thank but, you, but Colin. But I invite Colin to add whatever. I think <laughs> whatever he, he likes no, to. But it. Yeah, I, I don't want to ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Fernandez. Uh, Commissioner Solheim. Well, Heather, as she often does, are well articulated things that were swirling in my brain. So I just have one more follow up. Um, you know, you mentioned the, I believe the the RMX zoning that has the minimum um, height standard, and you know there are certainly areas, I think maybe such as this, where that zoning is maybe not quite appropriate, but we still want to see more than one. Do you do you imagine what we will ever, ever consider expanding that to other zoning districts in terms of a minimum height standard? Great question. Um, I think that we could expand it to other districts. I think it's right in line with what we're discussing with regard to transit-oriented development zoning. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than a base zoning district, applying it to a geography um, to, you know, to create a minimum height uh, requirement within the transit-oriented development overlay is something that we'll be sharing with the commission Thursday. You know, it's nowhere close to being ready for introduction, let alone adoption, but I think that that's something at the staff level that we've been giving a lot of thought to, and that would then extend to other mixed use commercial and employment districts and, and even the multifamily residential districts. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for that question, Commissioner. Um, Alder Heck. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if this is for Heather or Colin, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about RMU in the Odana area plan. Isn't RMX the only uh, zoning category that is part of that land use? Or there, or, or is, uh, you know, CCT and other things could be considered part of RMU? Yes. Um, the, there, there are other um, zoning districts that, that could fit in under okay. RMU, especially um, given the, the, kind of breadth of conditional uses that that can be approved for some of those districts. Okay, I see one. And then one other question, I'm looking at uh, a standard of approval number nine, which I know you've looked at a lot with regard to this. And I'm reading uh, that uh, the project needs to create an environment of sustained aesthetic desirability compatible with the existing or in intended character of the area, blah, blah, blah. Well, if, if that or is important to, in this situation, uh, existing or intended character, if it, if it can be either, how does anything ever change? Uh, <laughs> do you, uh, you know, how do we, I mean, yes, the plans guide us towards the future, but it seems like that language is sort of a barrier to change. Uh, do you, is there a way around that? Uh, is, is it really the implementation of the plans? I, I no, go ahead, Heather. I, I think I can turn that around in a different way. 
uh, also and, and say that sometimes the plan commission may be dealing with a proposal that is consistent with plans and it's eight stories tall, for instance, but it's surrounded by one and two story buildings. And so I think that or within that clause usually presumes that um, that it would be moving in that direction, like, you know, that the plan commission would be considering a more intensive use than what's around it, but saying, well, this is consistent with what the intended character of the surrounding area is. So I, I think it can go either way. Um, I would, I think I agree with where you're going that that or in there seems to present an opportunity, a path forward for this one, because it's consistent with what's around it. So it's meeting one of those two um, realities. Thank you. Clever answer. <laughs> okay. Are there other questions of staff? Other questions of staff? Seeing none, I would like to hear a motion. Commissioner Cantrell. Well, I'm going to recommend that the Plan Commission find that all other conditional standards, uh, including standard four, five, and nine can be met, and uh, that the commission approve the requested conditional use to construct a vi uh, vehicle access sales and service uh, window and and major alteration to the planned multi-use site at uh, 6831 Odana Road. Thank you, Commissioner. Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Solheim. Commissioner Cantrell, did you wish to speak to your motion? Yeah, I, I was grappling with this uh, uh, project too because we just recently approved the uh, Odana Road plan, but uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear Heather's explanation of, of this. And, and obviously it, it is consistent with the existing um, area uh, where most of the uh, uh, uses and buildings are one story, um, but it is inconsistent with the long, long term. And, and obviously the Odana Road plan is a very long range plan uh, for, for this huge area of the city. And, um, and which will be implemented over several decades, actually. Um, so I think that, that, that I, I view this as an interim use and that's why I'm considering it uh, as um, consistent with the plan. And eventually it will be redeveloped uh, because I think that um, uh, more density out here will, will just happen. But at this point in time, I think that uh, considering there's a, a fast food restaurant just next door and uh, several within, you know, a block or two of this site uh, and all one story, I'm uh, recommending that it be approved um, and support the, this uh, development. Thank you. Um, thank you. Are there other comments? Alder Heck. Thank you. Um, I, I, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Cantrell's comments and all the input on this. This is, it, it's on the line definitely as to whether I think this should be approved or not. But I, I feel like this, this differs, for instance, from the Portillo's or Portillo's, I guess it's called, that, that we approved on the south side of West Town Mall because the Odana area plan was not passed yet. And I, 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 I think that we need to kind of draw the line in the sand at some point. And if we're just going to uh, kind of not give that much weight to a plan because the zoning hasn't changed yet, I think we're going to set ourselves up for uh, a, an imperfect implementation of, of a plan and, and it's going to make it a lot more difficult. So, and, and, and I do appreciate the changes that the development team made to their design and, and, and the work that they did, but I just don't think it's the right place for this any longer. So I'm going to, I'm not going to support this. Thank you, Alder Heck. Are there further 
comments, discussion points? Commissioner Fernandez. Yeah, thank you, Chair Zellers. You know, I just want to say that I, I uh, deeply appreciate both the explanation of Commissioner Cantrell, um, which reflected very, very many of my thoughts, and of Alder Hex, which actually reflects where I intend to vote on the subject because, it, and I'm, I'm equally torn on it. I respect both sides to it, but somehow I would like to add more weight to the plan and the future vision. And I feel that in that sense, this is uh, quite inconsistent with it. So um, I just wanted to say that with all respect to, to all positions here. Thank you. And, and, and with respect to the developers who I think have done a, a, quite a good job of trying to address the concerns within the constraints of what they're trying to do there. Thank you, Commissioner Fernandez. Are there any other comments, input? Seeing no raised hands, I will assume unanimous consent unless I see raised hands to object. Um, Alder Heck and Commissioner Fernandez voting against the motion. Uh, motion passes. Um, thank you all. Uh, some, some good questions and um, good discussion. Okay, moving on. We have one more item on our agenda. Agenda item 12, Legistar 69786. Uh, with lots of registrants um, located at 3734 Speedway Road, 5th Alder District, consideration of a conditional use in the neighborhood mixed-use district for a mixed-use building with more than 24 dwellings and consideration of a conditional use in the NMX District for a building taller than three stories or 40 feet in height. And uh, the staff person who's going to give the overview is Chris Wells. Chris. Thank you, Chair and members of the Planning Commission. Staff believe that at three to four stories in height, the density of 65 dwelling units per acre, a mix of commercial and residential uses, and a location close to and oriented towards Speedway Road that the proposal could be found consistent with the comprehensive plan. However, staff have concerns with the consistency regarding the Hoyt Park Area Neighborhood Plan. That plan recommends buildings of one to three stories in height and identifies the transition along the northern property line to the single family residential to the north as a, quote, key buffer zone, unquote, and recommends, quote, maintain single family residential scale along adjoining streets and property edges, unquote. Regarding the height transition, it recommends to limit heights along the north property line to two stories. However, the overall height could be three stories with a setback at the second story along the southern edge of the building to take advantage of the grade change. That said, from a zoning code standpoint, staff note that one, the proposal meets the zoning codes requirements for side yard height transition to residential districts. Uh, it's MGO 28.064 parent three parent D. It meets that transition along the entire Northern property line. And it also satisfies the six foot building setback along the Northern property line that is required for the NMX uh, district in the zoning code. Staff also note that there is a roughly 10 foot drop west to east in grade across the northern lot line, which results in a greater height transition for four all the way down to, to one stories at the northeast corner along Waverly Place, as opposed to three stories transitioning to one and a half stories um, at the northwest corner of the site along Glenway. Staff direct the plan commission to approval standards five and 12 and have provided a additional discussion in the staff report. 
Staff note that there are numerous public comments that have been received and added to the public record for these requests. If the Planning Commission finds that, that all conditional use standards, including standards five and 12 can, can be found met, then the Planning Division recommends the Commission should approve the requested conditional uses to construct a mixed use building with over 24 units for a building in the NMX district um, and the conditional use for one exceeding three stories or 40 feet in height. Such approval shall be subject to the con conditions recommended by reviewing agencies as listed in the staff report. However, if the Planning Commission finds that, that conditional use standards are not met, the Planning Division recommends that the Commission place the request on file without prejudice and specify the standards that have not been met and the reasons such standards were not met. I'm happy to answer questions after the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I will open the public hearing. We will first hear from Kevin Burrow, University Avenue, Middleton, in support wishing to speak, representing Kenothi Bruce Architects. Kevin, you have three minutes. All right. Good evening. Thank you very much for your time this evening. As you can see before you, we are proposing a redevelopment of the former stop and go gas station site as shown in the center of the screen here. The uniqueness of the site is that it touches two streets, both Speedway Road and Glenway Street. And as Chris Wells had effectively pointed out, there's a high transition between the two streets of in excess of 10 feet. Can you go to the next slide, please. We are proposing a mixed use development here where the building height transition does come into play. Along Speedway Road, we have a three-story facade due to the fact that the lowest level, the parking level is exposed to grade. And then it transitions up to a four-story facade at, set, at the setback area. But on Glenway Street, we only have a two-story facade right along the sidewalk, more in the residential area there, that does transition up to a three-story as allowed uh, by zoning. And then on the northern side, we are stepping the building in three different locations, immediately above the first floor parking deck, and then above the third floor level of the building, transitioning up to the fourth story. The vehicular entrances are all focused on Speedway Roads. So we are not encouraging any vehicular traffic onto the residential Glenway Street. You go to the next slide, please. For the overall floor plan layouts, the lowest image is the first floor plan. And the front corner, that shaded gray, is our commercial space for this mixed use building. And then the uh, building lobby is immediately adjacent to that towards the southwest. And then we have the main vehicular entrance into the parking area where we have 24 parking stalls for this development. Second and third floor levels are the same where the building has stepped back on the northern side and we have a mixture of studios, ones and two bedrooms. And then on the fourth floor level, the building does step back on all sides that are adjacent to any public view or the residential area to the north. So we are able to provide a community room space up on that upper level facing the golf course, the Glenway golf course off across from Speedway Road. If you go to the next slide. We have produced a number of renderings that represent this building in scale and context to this area in regards to the topography and the adjacent buildings. So you can see the commercial building immediately adjacent to our site with its scale and height and how our building at a three-story facade right along Speedway does transition up to a four-story in the background, but you can barely see that and you would not see that from the street level immediately walking along the side of this building. Next slide. Here's another view front on then where you can see the vehicular entrance. And then next to that is the main lobby entrance and then the commercial space on the corner. Next slide, please. Here's a better view of that commercial area where we do have outdoor parking available as well. We're able to provide two parking stalls there. And then we are maintaining the screening along the residential area with the retaining wall and the wood fencing above that. Next slide, please. Here's a view on the Glenway Street side then, again, in contact and scale, where you can see the two-story facade adjacent to the existing two-story commercial building. Next slide, please. And then here's another Kevin, view along Glenway. Kevin, that concludes your available time. Thank you. Uh, the next registrant is Brandon Cook, North Baldwin Street, Madison, support wishing to speak. And uh, he's saying that he's not representing an organization. I think he's the developer. Could you clarify, Brandon? And you've got three minutes. Yes, I am the developer. Um, and I'm proposing this pro project in a direct response to the um, missing middle housing crisis. Uh, before this project, I 
did successfully develop the former stop and go on Winnebago Street and the Madison Teachers Union building on Willie Street. One of the things that all of these projects have in common are their blighted buildings that have uh, no current use. Um, as far as stop and go, uh, eliminating the use of both of these former locations and Madison Teachers Union moving on to a different facility. Um, but it's one of the things I look for in potential redevelopment projects, um, you know, I don't want to eliminate any existing housing stock. I don't want to push out any businesses. So this was uh, a great opportunity that um, would bring some much needed housing uh, to this area uh, specifically, but um, in the other areas as well. Um, this was a long time uh, stop and go that Quick Trip bought, um, you know, a while uh, less than a year ago they had it open for a few months and they realized it wasn't a viable business they put it on the market and um like i said before i just thought it was a, a wonderful opportunity to add some some much needed housing um you know we worked really hard to design a, a building that fits in the space i mean in reality this has the contents of a three-story building uh the parking is visible on the speedway side so it bumps me up to a four story um but i think it it, it is fitting with the uh neighborhood plan on on overall density um and if it's fabric of the neighborhood on glenway where you do have a two-story uh step back to a three um and like i said the the four-story element on speedway is a is a fantastic place to put um uh, added size because you're facing uh, the golf course across the street. Um, overall, I've had a significant amount of interest from potential people that would love to move into this neighborhood. Um, it's a great neighborhood that's had very little development and uh, this just creates a, a great opportunity to, to add some much needed housing. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, the next registrant is Brian Nimidi Young School, uh, Glenway Street, Madison, neither support nor opposed and wishing to speak. Brian, you have three minutes. Go ahead, Brian. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. So I, I've obviously, I live in the neighborhood and I've worked on the neighborhood plan. Um, Based on the proposal and what the neighborhood plan suggests, I think the additional story on top, it seems to require a lot of uh, variances and and for the site, it doesn't really seem fitting. Um, most of the most of the buildings, when you think about like, for me living in the area, thinking about the Mineral Point, Speedway, and Regent Corridor are significantly shorter. Um, with respect to height, unless you're counting like West High School, which obviously an apartment building has a much different use than a high school. Um, the, the additional story I think is kind of a, a deal breaker for, for me looking at it as a, as a resident and I think how it casts shadows on the nor Northern buildings and then also doesn't fit with the adjacent roof lines. The, the amount of units, I don't think when developing a building, if you're looking at it from a binary perspective of either you can develop it and make it 31 units or maybe remove an additional five or six units off the top story and develop a 20 or 25 unit building. Um, I don't think it's that much of a loss to housing stock um, being supplied. I think the building, it, it looks, decent overall, but it's uh, not really fitting with the neighborhood, neighborhood plan and uh, some of the city specified uh, guidelines for designing a building. So that concludes my comments. Thank you. Thank you. The next registrant is Ulrich uh, Ditterly, North Blackhawk Avenue, Madison, opposed wishing to speak, representing himself and the Sunset Village Community Association. 
Uh, you have three minutes. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, I am speaking uh, for the neighborhood plan that is um, that was just mentioned and in opposition to this request because it does not meet the specifications in our neighborhood plan. In 2011, over 100 people in five distinct neighborhoods covered by this plan and two additional entities worked for three years to develop a plan that we all agreed with would be for the common good of the neighborhood. One of the specifics in this plan, which was previously mentioned and quoted from the neighborhood plan, speaks directly to this property. It's, it is referred to as M3 in the plan, in the coverage map. And I will again repeat what was read before, uh, but for the record, this is from the document itself from our neighbor, neighborhood plan. Uh, under M3, the third bullet on page 48 of that plan, it says, quote, limit heights along north property line to two, to two stories. However, the overall height could be three stories with a setback at the second story along southern edge of building to take advantage of the grade change. We would hope that this building would be redesigned, reconfigured to meet that language, which was agreed to by the city. We worked very closely for three years with the city and the city's consultant to come up with language that we all agreed was for the common good of that neighborhood. And I would ask that the developer respect this neighborhood plan and respect those limitations and uh, we would urge the plan commission to reject this conditional use request and ask that the developer limit the building to three stories with the setback on the third story as specified in the neighborhood plan. To do otherwise would set a poor precedent for the rest of the neighborhood uh, because we all know that there is a future development right down the street and there may be many more. Um, so please um, do not approve uh, this uh, for multiple reasons. But as I said, I'm speaking from um, for the neighborhood plan for the language therein that we thank, all want to so hard to your, with. That concludes thank your you. available time. Thank you. Uh, the next registrant is Carol Richard, Ross Street, Madison opposed, wishing to speak. Carol, you have three minutes. Thank you. Um, my name is Carol Richard, and I live in the neighborhood on Ross Street. I'm not at all opposed to development. I'm an architect. I spent my career designing public projects. I really like seeing good development happen, and I believe that most everyone in the neighborhood would like to see a nice development over an abandoned gas station. I am, however, opposed to this proposal for several reasons. First off, the project has been submitted as a mixed-use project within the neighborhood mixed-use district. Both the zoning ordinance and the comprehensive plan state that this district is established to encourage and sustain the viability of commercial nodes that serve the shopping needs of residents in adjacent neighborhoods. This proposal has one small commercial space located in the southeast corner of the building, this small space does not provide service to the neighborhood. It was clearly incorporated into the plans in order to get special dispensation for an increase in density under the supplemental regulations. The authors of the zoning ordinance and the comprehensive plan went to great lengths to set standards for how mixed use developments should meet the street. <clears throat> there are multiple diagrams in the ordinance describing the goal including a mandate that 60% of the length of the building along Speedway be windows and or doors. The goal is to enliven activity at the street level and to encourage pedestrian activity. Take a close look at the Speedway elevation. Starting from the southeast corner, there's one window for the single commercial space, followed by a, a fake window 
a small lobby for residents, and then a large roll-up door for cars and a trash room. I suppose if you count the roll-up door as an opening, it might come close to meeting the 60% requirement. But is that really what the authors of the ordinance had in mind? And is it good for our city? The Regent Street project previously presented in this meeting is really a good example of what should be happening at the street. Secondly, the development is way out of scale for the neighborhood. The Hoyt Park neighborhood plan specifically addresses this parcel of land as just previously described. Again, the guidelines state any development should maintain single family scale along adjoining streets and property edges. And it also states, again, the height of any development should be limited to two stories along the north property line. This proposal doubles that height, and the building is located six feet from the north property line, abutting single-story homes. This will significantly diminish the value of the adjacent property owners and will adversely affect their quality of life. It's just not fair to them. I really think the developer just needs to go back to the drawing board and come back with a proposal that meets both the requirements and the intent of the zoning ordinance, the comprehensive plan and the neighborhood plan. I encourage the planning commission to deny the two requests for conditional use. The building is going to be here for a long time. Let's make it right. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. Our next registrant is Claire Stapleton, Plymouth Circle, Madison, opposed and wishing to speak. Hello, my name is Claire Stapleton, and I live uh, in the area. I also used to teach urban planning at UW-Madison, so I'm probably rare uh, in that I'm, I've am i also read Section 28 and the other Madison ordinances. Indeed, I've taught classes from those sections of the, of the ordinances. I'm sure you're going to hear from many other people that there are significant problems with this. Uh, proposal. Yes, the number of units exceeds the neighborhood plan by more than 25%. The number of stories increase, uh, exceeds the plan limit by more than 25%. The number of parking spaces does not meet the city requirements. So rather than go into detail, I'd note that the neighborhood knows this proposal fails the basic standards required by the city. The developer knows the building doesn't meet the requirements. That's why they're applying to you. The city staff itself knows it fails. The staff report, while admitting the proposal does not meet the standards, indeed, they has to bend over backwards to even just allow approval. So let's face it, this is a dodgy proposal. It raises questions with respect to the zoning code, the comprehensive plan, and the neighborhood plan, not to mention traffic safety and discriminatory housing policies. Why does, it, why does this project keep going? It's almost like a zombie. What's going on? Why are we persisting with such a bad idea? The truth is the developer made a poor business judgment. They made a mistake. They bought a property that can't carry a profitable, quote unquote, residential use without a subsidy in the form of the conditional use permit for overbuilding that they need from the city. I don't think it's up to the city or the surrounding neighborhood to provide that subsidy. It was a business mistake, plain and simple. The developer needs to go back and come up with a viable business solution. In conclusion, I'd like to suggest that the application should either be straight out rejected or be sent back to the Urban Design Commission for some serious reworking. I don't want it to be a zombie project. I would much rather that you guys have the courage to put a stake through its heart tonight. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Um, the next registrant is Fred Berg, Ross Street, Madison, opposed and wishing to speak. Fred, you have three minutes. Okay, thank you. I'll just make a couple of points. I agree that this mixed use is just a device that's being used to squeeze more apartments into this building to make it pay off for the developer. It should, I mean, it's really kind of a fraudulent use of the mixed use. Uh, 
criteria. And then I have, I have a couple of concerns about safety. I've been uh, driving and entering onto a speedway for 14 years now. And one of the things I've learned is I no longer enter on Franklin. I don't enter on Hammersley. I always go back to the corner where there's a street light because uh, uh, there's a lot of aggressive driving that occurs there. And this kind of hidden garage that you come out of, that in one sense, you don't have a very good visibility. You have to kind of pull onto the sidewalk to be able to see out. Uh, the, the speed limit on Speedway is 30 miles an hour, 44 feet per second. The average speed, I'd say, is 50 or 60 feet per second. So it takes about a second and a quarter for a car to pass by that building. Uh, I think that's an accident that's waiting to happen. So I have some real concern about that. I would make sure that people, you only rent to people who have uh, fast cars and nerves of steel. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to get out of the building. Now, the second thing is I've noted that the, the trash area right now, it doesn't have any doors on it. It's just a location. It looks to me like the only way you can get trash out of that building is to have another door on the side of the driveway so they can wheel containers out and the trash truck can park on, on Speedway and go inside, get these containers, wheel them out, put them on the lift, go down again. I assume that would take about five minutes every time they pick up trash on Speedway. And that's also a, a safety hazard, I believe. So thank you. Thank you. The next registrant is Graham Pettit. Uh, Glenway Street, Madison, opposed and wishing to speak. Graham, you have three minutes. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you to everyone for your time tonight. This is my first uh, city meeting that I've ever been a part of. So thanks for letting me do this. So the proposal at this site is really mixed use to name only 800 square feet of commercial space. It's essentially a loophole in the mixed use zoning code. The developer himself has said that he thinks the space is best suited for a tax preparer or accountant, which will do very little, if anything, to serve the residents of the neighborhood. The reason for the existing mixed code, mixed use codes is to ensure new developments are not only, not only provide additional housing in a thoughtful and planned way, but also add some sort of value to the existing residents of the neighborhood. The proposed development does not bring any value to, to existing or future residents beyond a place to live and negatively impacts existing residents through a lack of parking, casting shadows on existing properties, and failing to fit in with the neighborhood's character. The height of the proposal is four stories for the majority of the building. It's not three. If the commission allows it, um, I think they should, well, I don't know if you can bring up that picture, but there was another slide there that would show the actual height of the building. And if you look at it on the northeast side, it really is four stories over the house next to it. The proposed development will dwarf any other building within a half mile of the location and will tower over the existing homes and properties adjacent to the location. The neighborhood plan was very specific and thoughtful about the location's future development and it advised that this location sh should not exceed three stories. If the proposal is approved, I have to wonder why the city even has codes, why the neighbors should develop plans and what the goal of, commission, what the goal of the commission is to approving these types of projects. The proposal that met the spirit of, a proposal that met the spirit of the mixed use would include retail and commercial space and have enough parking to meet the needs of the building's residents. I asked the commission to really consider the proposal and how it will impact the neighborhood and future developments like that at Morse Towing. I understand the need for more housing, but I think it's only fair to respect residents' wishes and existing codes. If the developer cannot make a profit with a smaller building, then that's fine. It's not the city or the residents' job to ensure that someone is able to make a profit. Finally, I really want to drive home that parking is a concern at this location. The proposed transit route uh, changes will reduce the bus routes peak, to peak hours only and make the need for parking even more paramount. Those able to afford to rent at this location will most likely be able to afford vehicles that will want to have one on site since the proposal will not provide any kind of retail space for them to patronize. If the plan is to have tenants park... Uh, I hope you can still hear me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if they're going to park on the street, the neighborhood is going to have to pursue permit parking, which will make the plan untenable. Conveniently, there is a solution that can solve two issues with one change. Remove the top floor. 
The top floor of development is seven units. The parking is seven spots short of having a one-to-one -one ratio, so get rid of the top floor. Additionally, this could solve the shadow casting problem, but we don't know because the developer refuses to make any compromises with their proposal. I'm willing to make compromises, but I think that... The Thank you, Graham. That concludes your available time. Thank you. Uh, the next registrant is Emily Hawk, Waverly Place, Madison, opposed and wishing to speak. You have three minutes, Emily. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. And I think it was Colin who was in charge of the technical stuff. If, could you pull up um, slide number three that um, Kevin Burrow was showing and Brandon Cook? Is that possible while I'm speaking? Chris Wells, can you do that? Go ahead, Emily. You do have three um, minutes. So yeah. why don't you go um, ahead? I mean, I am very much opposed to this. I am one of the uh, people in the neighborhood um, dramatically impacted by this. Um, if you go down another um, slide, please. Um, no, not those back. Uh, if you look at, uh, okay, slow down and go back. I'm losing too much time with this. Basically, um, you know, it is totally out of keeping with the neighborhood. Um, you know, the slides show a very sterile rendering of the neighborhood, and I understand that's how architectural things look, but these are real homes. Um, I, le I live on Waverly just two doors in from what would be the corner of this development. Um, you know, from my backyard and my deck where I've created um, a beautiful garden, I would be looking into the back of a four-story building. Um, my yard would be in shade, including the shade depiction pictures in the winter. My house would be in complete darkness. I have total privacy right now. Um, and uh, basically, I would be in my backyard with people on their balconies looking down into my yard. A lot of the emphasis has been on the front side facing um, Speedway, and I feel like the back side is getting ignored. Uh, Brandon Cook said he doesn't want to push out retail but this is potentially um, pushing out residents. Um, this is gonna dramatically impact the um, home value of people who live um, right by. Um, the commercial space is really a joke. Um, that little corner uh, building with two parking stalls, um, if it's a viable commercial um, space, they're gonna need more than two parking spots. Where are those people gonna park? On Waverly, because it's, it's right there. Um, I just strongly, strongly oppose this. I hope that um, the points that were uh, incredibly uh, articulately raised by uh, Carol and I think it was Claire um, be taken into consideration. Um, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, the next registrant is Damien Louet, uh, Glenway Street, Madison, opposed, wishing to speak. Damien, you have three minutes. Uh, Damien, you should be seeing a prompt to unmute yourself. Damien, there should be a prompt that might be underneath another window uh, for you to unmute so you can speak. Oh, I think we lost Damien. Yes, we did. Okay, then we will move on and maybe Damien will sign back in. Uh, the next registrant is Will Oshowitz, uh, Eskorum, Madison in support, wishing to speak, um, representing Madison is for people. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Will Ohovich. Uh, I'm here representing Madison is for people. We're a local pro-housing group. Um, I've submitted a letter and public comment, but uh, as of today, we have a petition with 208 signatures in support of this proposal. The reasons we support it shouldn't be a surprise to those on the plan commission. According to the house, the city's own estimate, the city needs to build 20,000 units in the next 10 years, 10,000 units in the next five years. This is just a drop in the bucket in terms of meeting those numbers. 
but it is making a difference. Regarding the height, what may seem uh, like a small proposal to the residents, when done time over time to project over project, leads to fewer housing units being created across the city. This really is a modest proposal. Uh, I live in a neighborhood of three and four story buildings. It's not radical. It's just a building. It's not going to hurt anyone. Um, regarding the parking, uh, the city does have no parking minimums for the neighborhood mixed use zone. Um, I think that establishes a precedent that the goal of a neighborhood mixed use is to discourage driving and encourage transit and biking. Now, building a single building is not going to turn this into a walkable neighborhood, but it is a start and we can't get there if we increase the amount of parking in the area. Regarding the commercial space, Quick Trip was not able to run a successful business there. There may be demand eventually for walkable retail in the neighborhood, and I'm sure the residents would like to see more of that. But one thing I have not seen suggested is instead of trying to cut back on this project, is instead encouraging additional resale space in the area or neighborhood mixed use plots in the area. That would meet the needs of the neighborhood while also allowing for enough housing. Um, again, I'd like to, if you are on the plan commission, uh, you should look at the pu public comments. Um, I'll send in the updated petition and you should read the comments by the people who signed that petition. Most of them are saying Madison has a desperate need for housing. Rents are up 10% in the past three years. Anyone who's tried to buy a house or a condo or a townhouse will tell you it's a nightmare. We just do not have enough housing in the city. Uh, with that, I'd like to yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Will. The next registrant is Crystal Flynn, Ro Ross Street, Madison opposed and wishing to speak. Crystal, you have three minutes. I'm sure there's no person by that name in attendance. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next registrant is Fred Berg, Ross Street, Madison opposed and wishing to speak. Fred, you have three minutes. Thanks, I already spoke. Okay, yeah. then we will move on to Tiffany V. You must have registered twice. Uh, Tiffany V, Ross Street, Madison opposed and wishing to speak. Tiffany, you have three minutes. Hi, thank you. I'd just like to um, point out a couple concerns I have with this uh, development. Um, the neighborhood plan specifically states that on the north side of this property, uh, the maximum height should be two stories, meaning uh, congruency with neighboring homes. Uh, the site in itself is not level. The north aspect of the property is higher and was described as being uh, one story higher than the southern end of the property. And the neighborhood code uh, specifically states that the, the building can be three stories on the south side, but only two stories high to be congruent with the roof lines of the existing homes. Um, I also have significant concerns for the neighbors that are in the close proximity of this area that they are gonna completely lose privacy of their backyards. There are 20 children under the age of nine there's going to be safety concerns with them just being to be being able to play in their backyards without being observed. Um, there's also con concerns with safety regarding the setback of the building. Uh, the requirement of the front side says 25 feet, but that parking garage says that it's going to be five feet from the sidewalk. As Fred nailed uh, earlier, that is not sufficient reaction time. Um, the picture uh, in the design failed to show that there is a fairly sharp curve on the intersection of Speedway and Mineral Point. Uh, if you're trying to make a left-hand turn with five feet of visibility going left, you are blind to the intersection to your right. Um, so cars are going to end up exiting that parking garage with insufficient vision and timing reaction for the safety of pedestrians, uh, children in the neighborhood, and they're going to end up cutting up Glenway and through the side streets that kids play on, um, Franklin is already a mess uh, between the poor condition of the road. Um, it's like off-roading your vehicle down and it, people just speed down it in rush hour. This is going to continue to cause problems there. 
But I think we need to, you know, respect the neighborhood code. It specifically states that neighbors should be able to enjoy privacy of their homes uh, by allowing this building to go four stories as opposed to the two stories. It completely eliminates that. People are going to lose privacy. They're going to lose home values. And you're going to see a mass exodus of the neighborhood if this is approved. So I'm asking uh, the developer, it can be done great. Um, if we expand the commercial space, I'm a small business owner. I rent 800 square feet. Uh, part of that includes the bathroom, the hallways. Um, it's insufficient small business and commercial space, even for a business of one like myself. Um, we need to make sure that we're fitting the needs of the neighborhood. Uh, the commercial is not doing that. And the size of the building is certainly out of scale with all the neighboring homes. I, I really have concerns for people's privacy if this were Thank able you, Tiffany, that concludes your available time. The next registrant is Alexander Zaleski, uh, Waverly Place, Madison, opposed and wishing to speak. Alexander, you have three minutes. Yes, thank you, Chair Zellers and the Plan Commission. Um, I've asked the IT representative to um, present two images um, that I've emailed recently to the PCC email. Ultimately, if you have the uh, land use application available, I'd ask you to bring up the land use application to page 23. Um, I feel a little bit uh, flummoxed by the presentation made by the developers and the architects. They completely failed to show the scale of the project on the reverse. Uh, we're looking at a three rising to four, four rising, rising to three story building um, in a community of first floor, second floor lofted homes. Um, to the point made previously about the privacy and the expectations of privacy, the structure is already two stories higher than what should be acceptable in this space, even with a rising third. Uh, we have expectations of parking, we have expectations of enjoyment, we have expectations of privacy, and we have expectations of community planning. Um, I think it's rather surprising that we are stuck <laughs> even having to debate this uh, at this late hour, um, given that it shouldn't have made this far. And I'd like to echo the points made previously that this is a, a, a gold mine for a developer who wants to be ambitious. I respect that. But this is also a community. We live here and we have to live with it. Um, the developer has previously developed a uh, stop and go, and I respect the attempt to do so here. But cook, cookie cuttering a new development in at four stories when the next nearest building is one story with a roof is crazy. The wraparound balconies are also completely unacceptable because we have no privacy in our backyards at this point. You're going to put reverse facing balconies and a whole top tier terrace. It's just beyond. So again, props to the developer for being ambitious, but this has to be opposed. It's opposed on the, on the plan commission side with regards to the zoning. It's opposed for the community proposal and it's opposed just for the sheer gut check. This is, this has no place here. So again, with respect to the business owners who have spoken and the other residents, we oppose this. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, the next registrant is Kate Vieira, Larkin Street, Madison, opposed and wishing to speak. Kate, you have three minutes. Hi, I'm uh, I'm Kate Vieira and I live on Larkin Street in the neighborhood. Thanks for your time. I'm fairly new to the neighborhood. Um, I'd like to say that I'm in favor of population density and multifamily housing on this site. Um, I have three objections to the project in particular. Um, the first objection, as um, many people have mentioned, has to do with the neighborhood plans calls for walkability and the mixed use zoning. Um, the retail is um, very small. There's only two parking spots for potential employees. Um, this de development ironically increases our reliance on cars because of the walkability issue over the old site, which was a gas station. Um, additionally, in terms of environmental concerns, the bus, um, the bus route along Speedway will no longer stop um, as frequently on this site. Um, so um, I'm concerned about that and concerned about the, the lack of retail to serve the shopping needs of the neighborhood as outlined in the neighborhood plan and as many of my neighbors have spoken to. Um, the other issue I have um, actually coincides with what Will said in terms of affordability and housing. Um, we know that um, development is important for the housing crisis, but what's really needed is affordable housing. My understanding is that the developer is asking for several conditional use approvals, and I think this is a big ask. So, you know, if he's going to make this ask, I would like to see this more directly meet Madison's housing needs in a way that's more equitable. 
um, by making it affordable housing. The final thing I want to mention has to do with the process. And I think um, a lot of folks who have spoken um, tonight have gotten to this in different ways. The communication about this development has been really incredibly incredibly difficult. When I first um, called my alder to um, speak to her about it, I was just curious what the retail was going to be like. I'm a single parent. I was hoping I could send my kid down the block for a gallon of milk. This was like literally my kind of basic concern, like what was going to go in there. And she said, nothing can be sold there, no food, because Quick Trip had put deed restrictions on the property that said no food could be sold there, which I believe is an unethical practice. So I called them up and they were incredibly communicative. They um, withdrew the deed restriction, so now food can be sold there. Um, and then I was told by the alder, well, actually, she didn't tell me anything. She told the paper something and didn't return my phone calls. Brandon wouldn't return my calls. All the time, Quick Trip was returning my calls. So I think part of the frustration here is that um, we're not being heard in this process has not been collaborative. If and there is a there is a need for housing, so why don't we go back and why aren't the community members seen as partners in developing some housing solutions that would take all of our opinions um, and our feedback and the neighborhood plan and the work that people who have been here much longer than me have put in to create some 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 solutions that we can all buy into? It seems like a backwards kind of process um, at the community. Thank you, thank you Kate. That, that concludes your available time. Uh, the next registrant is Perry Leibel, uh, Hollister Avenue, Madison, opposed and wishing to speak. Perry, you have three minutes. Hi. Um, I own a home on Waverly Place, which is a, a, a half a block from uh, the Speedway Road proposal, and I, and I oppose this. Um, our Small 1,300 square foot home will be dwarfed and, and overshadowed by a four story, almost 50,000 square foot building immediately to the south. Um, as others have said, this will negatively impact the enjoyment of our home and uh, our property value. The developer is proposing a building that is twice as high as that recommended in the neighborhood plan. Uh, this particular lot is referenced specifically in the plan and it clearly states a height limit of two stories along North property line. If this proposal is approved, there will be a four-story building six feet from residential property lines to the north. I oppose a four-story building abutting modest one-story homes with no transition and no buffering. Currently, you can drive from Camp Randall to Whitney Way, and you won't see any buildings higher than two stories adjacent to res that residential homes. If this proposed development is approved, it will set a precedent for all future development in our neighborhoods. Secondly, our neighborhood currently has no grocery, drug, or convenience store in walking distance, yet the developer has sacrificed parking and usable retail space to add more rental units. 31 rental units with only 24 parking spaces will cause overflowing parking and traffic in neighborhood streets, many of which, like ours, are narrow and without sidewalks. In addition, because of the difficulty of entry off Speedway from the West and lack of on-site parking, drivers will drive around the block either to enter the building or to look for on-street parking. This will negatively affect our neighborhood by causing more traffic on the streets and more parking problems. I would welcome the development of the site in a way that serves the shopping needs of neighborhood residents and increases affordable housing. This proposal does neither. We have zoning ordinances and a neighborhood plan for a reason. This proposed development does not fit at the site and it de deviates wildly from the existing neighborhood and city comprehensive plan in both height and density and will result in negative impacts on our neighborhood. I ask you not to approve this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Perry. The next registrant is Mark Barnes, Hollister Avenue, Madison opposed and wishing to speak. Mark, you have three minutes. Mm -hmm. 
Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Mark Barnes and I own a house on Waverly Place, um, obviously directly to the north of this proposed development. I, like all the other people in the neighborhood that have spoken, am opposed to it because of its current size and scope. But again, want to stress that I welcome a development on this site that conforms to the current zoning and current neighborhood plan. The sheer size with four stories on Waverly Place and three on Glenway Street towers over the nearby houses and will clearly decrease the enjoyable use of those houses by the, the owners. The setbacks and stepbacks proposed are in, in, inadequate on this site because of how small it is and close to the houses, as said before, six feet from those the first ones on Waverly Place. I, I do find it interesting that no renderings from the north have been shown to actually show what it would look like for the houses on Waverly Place and how close this thing is to them. Um, as has been said, it will also, because of the height of the building and the fact that it has balconies, it will also uh, reduce the privacy and, and enjoyment of those people that are on the back because there will be people in the apartments looking right straight over into, into their homes. The parking is also a huge problem because there are 24 stalls for 31 units. And the only ones that have included parking are the two two-bedroom units. So it's likely that most of the other tenants that have cars will go ahead and try to park on the streets. I'm, I'm greatly concerned about the parking on the streets behind this, this proposal because most of them do not have curb and gutter or sidewalks. So the extra cars will be sharing the roads with pedestrians and bikers and I worry about mostly kids getting run down by somebody flying around looking for a parking stall. The developer and Alder said that it would help the public transit could reduce the need for street parking. But with the Metro plan for 2023 and beyond, it eliminates all service on Speedway other than at rush hours. So the residents who, for example, wanted to shop because they can't shop on site, in their own house, they want to shop somewhere else and come home, have to walk almost three quarters of a mile from the two closest bus stops. The other thing I'll address is that uh, I know there's a petition that's in support of this, that as of this morning, when I analyzed it, it had 200 signatures. I just want to go on record as saying 9% of those signatures were from people in the neighborhood in the same zip code as this proposed development, 9%. Thank you, Mark. That concludes your available time. The next registrant is Alex Salutos, Hammersley, Madison, Wisconsin, opposed and wishing to speak. Alex, you have three minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman uh, Zellers. Uh, before I get into my remarks, based on the previous comments, I just wanted to share a couple of facts. There are seven commercial buildings close by this uh, proposed building. Five are one story, two are two story. The proposed building is 50,000 square feet. The average of the other seven commercial buildings is about 1,500 square feet. So back to my comments. Uh, bottom line first, uh, this needs to be referred to the Urban Design Commission, number one. Two, you need to refer consideration of the application uh, for the conditional uses to a future meeting until after the Urban Design Commission has submitted their recommendations. And the staff report can re be reviewed and the errors and omissions in it addressed. If you vote on the, and four, if you vote on the application today, it should be placed on file without prejudice. There's strong neighborhood support for adhering to the goals and standards in the zoning code, the comprehensive plan and the neighborhood plan in opposition to this project in its current form. A hundred residents, all from the adjacent neighborhoods, have signed a petition to this effect, which is in the file. The petition also supports housing, including affordable housing, and activating the site. You also have an email from the co-presidents of Sunset Village, the largest neighborhood association served by this site to this effect. 
The project is not in harmony with the purpose of NMX district zoning, which are commercial uses that serve the shopping needs of adjacent neighborhoods. Any other goals, including housing, are secondary to this uh, uh, use. The project eliminates a heavily patronized commercial use that serves shopping needs of the adjacent neighborhoods and replaces it with one that will not. There are lots of buts about continuing operation of a C store there, but they all can be addressed. There is evidence of several errors and omissions in the staff report that are material and significant. It appears the goals and standard used in the report were cherry picked to justify the conclusions and recommendations. You have a memo on file with details and five of the most significant material errors and omissions in the report. This design raises significant questions relative to the goals and standards in the code, comp plan, and neighborhood plan. It also will set the precedent for redevelopment of the seven other commercial properties that are nearby. There are several major elements of the design that are significantly out of conformance with the applicable goals and standards. It's critical we get this right. For these reasons, it needs to be referred to the UDC. It's obvious the developer is gaming the system, as others said, to get additional dwelling units. Um, I believe that conditional use standards three, four, seven, nine, and 10 are not met. And in summary, this proposal is so inconsistent with the applicable goals and standards that an entirely- Alex, that, con that concludes your available time. Um, there are no other registrants on 12 um, wishing to speak. I will loop back to um, agenda item um, 11, a registrant, uh, Adam Paganoff, who's also registered for 12, um, uh, in support and wishing to speak on Cantwell Court in Madison. Is Adam Paganoff uh, registered, Jesse? Um, no, that person is not in attendance, but we do have Damien uh, Louye. Oh, Okay. Okay, uh, Damien, you have three minutes. Hi there, sorry for the earlier technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, I would just like to say that, uh, uh, you know, several years ago when we worked with Vandewall and Associates uh, as a neighborhood to get a, a use uh, plan in place, um, Many of us in the neighborhood were dissatisfied with the process, largely because uh, we felt somewhat steamrolled by uh, the plan in regards to uh, height of buildings and allowable use, um, but eventually have gotten used to uh, what it allows. However, this is the first developer that has come along to develop what is essentially uh, this commercial mixed use space uh, within these corners of Mineral Point and Glenway. Um, but uh, already the, the very first development proposed uh, within the new use plan uh, is asking for conditional exceptions to uh, the plan. And um, I feel like entertaining any uh, alterations to our plans uh, that we already approved uh, is short-sighted and um, we'll set up a, you know, essentially a run of, of development that doesn't fit what the neighborhood has actually requested in uh, this space. Um, we, uh, my wife and I live at 305 Glenway Street, which is going to be in the shadows of this building. Um, winter sun is already a problem in Madison uh, and a four-story building on our block is definitely going to affect our enjoyment of this space um, as, as, uh, as built. The bus issue uh, is huge because uh, the developer is stating, you know, that uh, 
this is a walkable area walking to the hospital which is about mm, two miles away uh which is fine you know um but uh not being able, these residents not being able to use buses, not having anywhere to sh locally shop for convenience goods, uh, as has been stated, is a problem. And none of us are necessarily opposed to development of this space. We simply are just Amy, and opposed. that concludes your available time. Um, we have some other registrants. Um, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. Uh, Henry Flogel, Waverly Place, Madison opposed, not wishing to speak, but available to answer question. Uh, Sarah Flogel, Ray Waverly Place, Madison opposed, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. And Jonathan Gapem, Regent Street, Madison support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. Are there questions of any of our registrants? Commissioner Fernandez. Thank you, Chair Zellers. Yeah, I have a question of the developer. Um, as far as the door to the parking area, is it going to be open at all times? I'm, I'm, there's been several concerns expressed regarding uh, access and egress. But a left turn into that building with a very small setback on uh, on Speedway, uh, you know, if that door is closed and it has to, somebody has to activate something, the, the car is going to be parked, stop with its rear end in Speedway Street. It seems to me. I'm not sure. I've exactly analyzed that. But how is that left turn in there going to be? accomplished. Kevin Burrow? Yes, I can answer that. Um, the garage door itself is actually set back approximately 19 and a half feet from the property line, which is beyond the backside of the sidewalk. So there is actually sufficient space for a vehicle to pull in and not okay. be overhanging the sidewalk while waiting for the door to open. It'll be remote controlled um, by the residents of the area, so they could activate the door prior to pulling up to the door to be able to pull in. But uh, we do have sufficient space to stage a car within our property. Okay, thank you. I, I missed that setback somehow on when I looked at the plans. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner uh, Alder Heck. Thank you. Uh, this is probably for Brandon Cook. Um, can you, I have two questions. Uh, first, um, can you tell us your reasons for not putting a larger commercial space in or two commercial spaces? And can you tell us why you can't just remove the seven units on the fourth floor? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, the commercial space was very difficult because ultimately if we increase the commercial space, we're eliminating parking. The topography on this site is very difficult, uh, dropping 10 feet from um, back to front. And so in an ideal world, um, if this was on flat ground, this would be a three-story building. Um, and there would be more opportunities for commercial uh, with the parking underneath. But these are the constraints of the lot. And so it's a really a give and take where I wanted to create some commercial space because I love the look of commercial buildings, but frankly, it just doesn't work. Um, we had thoughts of putting commercial space on Glenway, you know, removing a couple units. Um, but I think for a business owner, it would be very difficult not having the visibility of Speedway um, to get business. And so, once again, I go back to Quick Trip and um, the viability of this location. I mean, they might have had it open a month or two, and they said, we sell a ton of gas, um, but that's about all we sell. Nobody comes here to get uh, anything from in the store, and we can't make it viable. And so, while Quick Trip did open up these items um, to be sold, 
and a future commercial space on this site, uh, it did take away adult material and gas. So even um, repurposing the existing building into a new gas station by a new owner, uh, it can never be a gas station again. And so we ended up in this spot because um, housing's uh, a driving factor um, in Madison. The commercial space, um, they're difficult to fill. Um, this one, I have no worries in filling. And even if, I, if there was an opportunity to make a bigger space, um, I would have no problem filling it because I do go the extra mile. Um, build out wise for tenants to make it um make it a viable option for a small business um quick trip runs a great operation they make a lot of their own food um and this was part of the stop and go um the 30 stores that they they purchased and if they can't make a go of it uh, i find it hard to believe that anybody else uh could make it make a go of it. So there was my, my quandary, let's create a commercial space that just doesn't work at this location. Um, and so we ended up here, um, no trickery trying to, you know, add more units. Um, I don't think it was right to make it an all residential building and have units facing speedway. I mean, that would be, uh, you know, not, not very appealing to the residents and having it all, uh, parking, while it would increase, possibly increase the number of parking stalls, it doesn't give the look of the building uh, to be more inviting. So I think we took everything and came up with the best something possible. If we made uh, commercial bigger, we just have to take away more parking. And, um, you know, I don't think that there is a, a viable business um, that would go in a bigger commercial space. Okay. And, and how about the the seven apartments on the top? The big issue, once again, with this site is the topography. So my cost, um, and just a really quick about myself, I mean, to do a project like this, I am the builder also. Um, nobody else could develop a project like this uh, because it wouldn't be worth it. I mean, we talk about missing metal. Um, and frankly, these, these projects just don't make any sense. So uh, the talk of me running to the bank and making all this money, it's its simply not true. It's a very difficult project. It's a small project. Um, I, of course, wanted it bigger. You know, I wanted a fifth story. I wanted a full third story. But as opposed to um, proposing something large uh, and having everybody get worked up, I came with a project that was very reasonable, that has a step back third uh, story, um, and it would have a, as little impact. So yeah. Um, one of our neighborhood meetings, somebody suggested, well, why don't you just lessen the amount of units and uh, increase the price by all the apartments? And once again, uh, it's a suggestion, but it just won't work because these are market rate. People would only pay so much. Um, so just removing the, the third slash fourth story, I mean, it's by far the cheapest part of this whole project and is the driving force to remove, uh, remove the top story and have uh, two levels of residence. I mean, it's just, it can't be done. I mean, it's just, it just can't be done. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Sure. Just, just a follow up. Uh, so what do you say to someone who says, I, I understand that maybe it's not financially feasible, but it's just in the wrong place. I would say 11 years ago, 10 years ago, whenever the neighborhood developed their plan, uh, was a different economy. Lumber prices were different. Uh, labor was different. We were just coming out of a recession. So back in 2011, I could make that project work uh, at a lesser size. But these are just fundamental truths that everything is ungodly expensive. Um, and to say uh, and to say otherwise, uh, it's just not just not true. Um, you know, I I know. It's a typical thing developers say, I need more units, I need more space, but it really came with a, a reasonable project considering the topography where it has the contents of a three-story building. I mean, it's on a, it's on a slope lot. I, there's, there's nothing I can do. So in a normal project, um, you know, I wouldn't have the exposed parking and it would be a three-story building and it would fit 
uh, with the neighborhood plan um, a little bit better. But considering all the factors, having the density next to Speedway, uh, when I first looked at this project, I thought, wow, what a great place. I mean, I couldn't find a better location for this size building. Um, having successfully done the last stop and go, which was a fourth story building with, uh, with parking on ground. So in this context, it would be a five story building. Um, got so it. I, I for, got it. I, I think you've answered Brandon. I, I appreciate all of that information. Thank you. Uh, Alder heck. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, the next, uh, let me see, uh, commissioner Cantrell. I have a couple of questions for the architect. Um, someone raised the um, issue about garbage collection, how that uh, they would um, adequately maneuver that on the site um, or to the site. So could you address that? And the second question uh, is the, uh, is there a vision triangle uh, issue of, of vehicles uh, exiting the parking garage? on Speedway, uh, you could probably address those at the same time. Thank you. Ke Kevin Burrow? Yes. Yes, thank you. I appreciate those questions. With regards to the um, trash pickup, um, as was mentioned by one of the um, residents nearby, we do need to have an access door off of the side of the driveway into that trash room. We did not show that door on the plan. These are just concept plans still as opposed to final construction documents, but there will be an access door on the side where the um, trash pickup company will be able to roll out. These will be larger uh, two yard rolling dumpsters that will be pulled out and picked up off of Speedway Road. Um, that is a fact as to how the um, trash will be picked up given the proximity of setting the building directly onto the street. So that um, hopefully that answers that question. In regards to the vision triangle areas, um, Access into the garage is sufficient for um, vision triangle clearance. Exiting out, um, we are needing to ask for a vision triangle reduction. We do have the overall depth to stage a vehicle behind the sidewalk, and there is sufficient space, but we need to factor in not blocking the sidewalk with the vehicle. So there will be a, a request for reduced triangle. We need to have a 10-foot clearance, and we do not achieve that at this time on the southern side. Uh, so the the garbage collection will be collect the the garbage truck will be parked in the street and then uh, the uh, containers will be rolled out to the 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 truck. Is that what I what you what you said? Uh, yes, that is what I said. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um. Did you have any further questions, no. Commissioner? Okay. Are there further questions of any of our registrants? Uh, Commissioner Fernandez. Uh, thank you. This, this is a question for Brandon. Um, was there any consideration uh, for putting the parking further underground? In other words, bringing the Parking down a story, bringing the entire height of the building down a story. Is that, uh, was, was that considered? Is that uh, um, obviously not feasible? Uh, we absolutely considered it, um, but then we would need a parking ramp, which would eliminate uh, a lot more stalls. So, you know, my question was, can we create two levels of parking, um, but with the size of this lot and uh, the parking ramp? Uh, it's you, you're, 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 you're getting more, but then you're taking it away, um, just to get, get down there. I mean, if it was, uh, like I said, if it was the topography was flat, it'd be a different story, but, uh, being inside of a hill, um, it's not completely tragic on speedway, but we're already going down a story, um, on Glenway, but then two stories down is creating an awfully big hole for a two and a half, three story uh, building. Um, so it wasn't feasible uh, to try and increase more parking that way. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cantrell. Yeah, 
Um, one other question for the architect. Uh, could you um, uh, show the, the building facing the, on the north side and uh, describe for the commission the, the height of, that, of the building? I know that it, from Glenway down to uh, uh, Speedway, the, the, it, it slopes towards uh, Speedway. But I guess um, I'd like to know what the height of the building at uh, uh, Glenway is and the height of the building uh, further down. Uh, so the height of the building along Glenway. And can you show at, the illustration, please? Um, staff? Yeah, staff, if they could pull up the elevation views. Chris, yeah, okay, wonderful. Yeah, so if you would zoom in on the right-hand side of that top image. Well, actually, this shows both runway and um, the speedway sides at the bottom portion. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have on the Glenway side, we're at 100, or I'm sorry, we're at 34 feet to the uppermost parapet. And then on the um, speedway side, we are at approximately 46 feet to the uppermost parapet. Okay. So, um, so pretty much the, the parking uh, uh, is buried at the Glenway, um, at, uh, at Glenway. Correct, yeah, it's a full story underground. We're about 12 feet higher on what would be the second floor level technically, but first floor on Glenway as a compared to the driveway entrance off of Speedway. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you. Any further questions, Commissioner Cantor? Uh, not at this time, thank you. Okay. Uh, are there other questions of our registrants? Are there any other, okay. Commissioner Solheim. I just wanted to follow up on the trash collection question. Um, I'm sure you've looked at reconfiguration of this quite a bit. So I was just wondering if there is any way that the trash room could be moved or that the trash could be picked up in the surface parking lot so it was not blocking the street. Um, if that was anything that you had looked at throughout drafting. Kevin? Yes, uh, there is opportunity for the trash truck to be able to pull into that surface parking lot if they would choose to roll the dumpsters up to that area. That is a potential option depending upon when trash pickup is. But as we looked at this building, given that it's only 31 total apartments, um, trash pickup in the street is what occurs for every other business in this area, or I'm sorry, every other residence in this area, such that we felt it was appropriate um, it will be scheduled accordingly for them to be able to physically do it. It's a private company that would do it so they could have it occur at early hours in the day when there would be less traffic on the road. Okay. Thank you. That, that was my only question. Thank you. Are there further questions of the registrants? Seeing no raised hands, I'll close the public hearing. Are there questions of staff? Commissioner Fernandez. Thank you, Chair Zellers. Yeah, inevitably, sorry. But um, first question of staff is um, the definition of a mixed-use building. Um, I'll say my, my main concern here is not the overall height, but the lack of... <clears throat> lack of anything uh, uh, activating the community. Uh, I'm sorry, one, one moment. Um, of activating the neighborhood or creating walkability. Uh, 800 square feet does not feel like a mixed use building. Are there standards that govern the definition of a mixed use building, a minimum amount of commercial space that would allow it to have that designation or something of that nature?
So Chris, are you going to take that? Heather, are you going to take it? Okay, Heather, you're up. Thanks. I, I can take it. So a mixed use building, I mean, it's, it's it, the use in the code is called dwelling units and mixed use buildings. And the zoning code allows for a wide variety of um, the amounts of commercial space on the ground floor of a building. Um, in, in many cases, the plan commission considers uh, conditional use for, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, there's a basketball game on and I'm uh, hearing it from downstairs. Okay, so the, in, in many cases, the plan commission will consider a conditional use for less commercial space than 50% of that street facing facade. You might remember that from the recent changes to the, the housing ordinance where we were looking at opportunities to generate um, more housing, uh, albeit maintaining some of those, those built-in incentives in the, in the zoning code for mixed use buildings and commercial first floors. Um, so 800 square feet, I would say is a small commercial space, but it's not atypical of some that we've seen recently and some that the plan commission has seen, even in areas that have more uh, vibrant uh, commercial, like a full commercial corridor than what I would consider this node at, at Speedway. So I think, you know, it, it could be a concern. 800 square feet doesn't support a whole variety of commercial uses. It's a very small space, probably a, a small business um, or a group of small businesses moving in and out over time. Uh, I do think it's it's leasable, maybe more easily leasable than a large larger commercial space might be at this location. As many of you know, we struggle in Madison with commercial spaces that go unleased for years in some of the brand new buildings and some of our richest, most vibrant commercial corridors where there's a lot of active commercial spaces. And so it's a it's a tough issue, but I would say that it's not atypical. I, I don't see a gaming of the system here. The zoning code was set up to incentivize some mixed use, even if that's a small commercial space in an otherwise predominantly residential building. And it seems as if um, that aspect of the intent of the code um, is, is being uh, employed for this development proposal. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. I have a, a different question, if I could go ahead and ask it. Yes. And that is in the definition of side yard versus rear yard. I guess as a, uh, my initial impression would be that the north line of this is actually the rear line being close to parallel to the face on Glenway, and that the northeast and southwest lines would be the side yard. If that makes if that makes sense, is there are there rules that govern which of the lines of the lot shall be considered a side line and which shall be considered a rear line? Um, Chris, uh, no, I, I don't. I believe the applicant has the choice of either Glenway or Speedway to choose as their front yard. True. They they chose Glenway, and, and therefore the um, northern property line is a is considered a side side lot line. Okay, I, I guess that answers it. But I would say a side lot line I would expect to be uh, perpendicular to the front lot line. Right there, there. And but the north line is not even close to perpendicular to the Glenway line. It fe it feels and I know it's not a rectangular site, but uh, it it that feels like the rear line to me, just being that it's much closer to parallel to the front line. Does that make sense or? Heather, can you explain that any better? I know that we've gone through all kinds of things and that there has been some definitions um, of that, but it can be a little confusing, I think. It, it can be. This site is, is atypical. It's, it's a through lot. You know, we, we have frontage on both the western and southeastern sides of the lot. So both of those sort of function as the the 
the fronts, the street facing facades, and, and therefore the other two sides of the building are the side yards. And so developers will, will very frequently consult with zoning staff really early on to try to figure out what their interpretation is and how, um, how these yards apply. But if you, if you take a look at just the site plan and see, you know, immediately to the south, there's another building that's existing and to remain. This is a through lot that bridges the, the western and, and eastern streets. So the north and south sides of the building are the side yards. North and south. Okay. Um, okay. So, but, but I guess in summer, you are completely comfortable with how the, the developer has identified that long uh, yes, northern I mean, line as its side yard and with its six foot setback. Okay. Yes, thank you. and as our as our zoning staff, um, who have been you know working closely with right. the developer on this since the beginning. Okay. As thank. Well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um. Any further questions of staff? Heather, do sure, you want so to I, I do. I'd, I'd like to add something and invite Chris to jump in as well. I think. Um, there is an important provision in the code that relates to both side and rear yards with regard to transitioning taller buildings down to the lower density, shorter buildings next to them. And that same transition rule applies to both side yards and to rear yards. And so if you take a look at the site plan, you'll see that the building does step down to the residential to the north. Um, at the second, at the second floor, and then back to the third, and then up and back to the to the fourth, and so that's um, consistent with the requirement in the zoning code. Um, just wanted to mention that, and I'll turn it over to Chris, who could better explain it with this visual. Thank you, Chris. Do you want to add anything to that? Can you? Yeah. Can you? Yes. Okay. So this is the uh, the Glenway um, elevation. And in red, I've shown the setback, uh, or sorry, the residential height transition in red. And then this is the corresponding view looking from, from east. From the east. It, 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 it's the northeast elevation, but it shows this is the north. This line is, is, is the same as this line, but looking from the other side of the building. So the, the, the building abutting the northwest corner of the parcel, uh, sorry, no, sorry, northeast corner, is actually one story in bulk, then steps back, I don't know, it's roughly 10 or 12 feet. There are the two balconies, so that there, there's a building, step back, goes up two stories, and then steps back, I don't know, it's roughly 20, say 15 feet. So um, the building in, does comply with the prior residential setbacks for the NMX district. Um, so there is no conditional use required uh, for this building. So while the height is, um, it triggers that um, conditional use, the residential transition requirement uh, is met. Thank you, Chris. Did you have any follow-up questions? Um, no. Okay, uh, Commissioner Solheim. Thank you. Um, just one quick question. I think uh, there were questions with the architect earlier about the height of the building at different uh, parts. And I just wanted to clarify, if I'm reading the staff report correctly, the, the current height limit under zoning is three stories or 40 feet. I know that the 40 feet can't go above three stories, but those, uh, is, is that correctly? I'm just trying to kind of compare the current height of the building to that 40 foot limit. Yes, because the uh, low story, the, the parking level basically in commercial, uh, because that is more than 50% exposed is considered a full level. Uh, okay. so it is considered a four story building. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that, Chris. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, any further questions of staff? Uh, Commissioner Hagenow. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I have a question about this, uh, the vision triangle and the, the turning in and out of the parking there. Um, I drive that route regularly to and from work. Um, and that corner is a kind of a crazy corner. Um, and, and my fear is people coming, I guess, going north on Speedway right? And running into the rear end of somebody trying to make a left-hand turn in there uh, is going to be quite dangerous. And then coming out of there and trying to make a left-hand turn is going to be quite dangerous as well as those cars come around that corner if if it's not very visible. Um, and what I, I guess kind of along with that, what are the uh what what does staff look at or maybe that's a question for zoning i i'm not sure um as to what level of variance they allow you know if it if if it's supposed to be 10 feet and you only have five feet is that a completely unacceptable level uh and yeah i'll see if i come up with anything else as we go on chris um, I did not have a chance for, I, I did not speak with Sean Malloy of traffic engineering. Um, there is a condition of approval. It's number 31 in the staff report. Um, I would just kind of infer that the fact that this was a, this was not marked as a major non-standard comment, uh, leads me to believe that Sean has less of a concern than if it was a major non-standard. Um, I'm just reading it. It does not. It says that the applicant shall adhere to all vision triangle requirements as set out in MGO 27.05. In parentheses, no visual obstructions between the heights of 30 inches and 10 feet at a distance of 25 feet behind the property line at streets and 10 feet at driveways. Then he goes on to list um, aspects that are in compliance. So I, I don't know if Heather has any other thoughts, um, but unfortunately, I, I don't know exactly what, you know, and how in compliance and, and his level of comfort. Sure. Heather? Sure. I think, again, Chris and I are trying to wear some traffic engineering hats, which maybe isn't our best <laughs> look, but I think that um, there are opportunities, strategies to overcome the the issues regarding safety and the vision triangle. And as, as mentioned in, in 31, one of the most frequent ones that I've seen is the incorporation of transparent materials or removal of some of the building and replacement with columns so that drivers and pedestrians can see each other, despite the fact that there's not a clear uh, 10 foot vision triangle there. Um, I experience that every day walking by our brand new parking garage um, right by the, the municipal building. There's a nice transparent wall. So as drivers are emerging from that garage, um, they and myself as a pedestrian can, can see one another, even though there's building there, it, it's a window. That, that's just one strategy. I think it's fairly common for traffic engineering to work with development teams to overcome safety concerns um, like this one. Okay, thank you. Are there no, any yeah, other questions? Did you have a, another question, Commissioner Hagen? No. Okay. Are there any other questions of staff? Commissioner Cantrell. The question I have is the height of the building on um, Glenway. Uh, I, I think the architect said it's. Um, I think around 35 feet. And if this, if that edge of the property were zoned uh, TRC1, what would the maximum height of that, um, of a building of a new house or duplex um, on, on that, in that district be? Isn't it 35 feet? Yes, I believe that's right. Yep. So, so this this elevation of this building would be no no taller than a single family house if they 
if it was zoned that way and if someone wanted to build a single family house on that on that side. Okay. Is that correct? Heather. Heather, is that correct? GRC three that the height limit is uh two stories or right. three feet. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Heather. Any further questions of staff? Seeing no raised hands, I'm looking for a motion. Commissioner Solheim. Okay, I'll take a go at this. Um, I move that the plan commission finds that the standards have been met and approve the requested conditional uses for a mixed use building at 3734 Speedway Road, subject to the conditions in the staff report. And is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Cantrell. Commissioner Solheim, did you wish to speak to your motion? Sure. Um, briefly, I um, have looked at this quite a bit, as I'm sure we all have. Um, it's not it's not an easy one when you really dig into the plans and the standards. However, I do feel that it is consistent with the uh, recent comprehensive plan in terms of density and uh, height. Um, I understand that the older neighborhood plan um, varies a bit. And so we're dealing with a little bit of inconsistency when you look strictly at height. Um, however, I think that the combination of the site topography and the fact that you know our city continues to change and the recommendations in the comprehensive plan, I'm uh, very comfortable with this proposal. And I think it's a, it's a high quality development in an area of the city that I know a lot of people would like to move to um, and, and, you know, it, it could really support some new residents to also support additional retail in that area. I know there is concern about wanting more neighborhood retail. And um, I think one of the reasons that some of the retail in that corner has struggled has been a lack of density where you see it being more successful in the nearby Monroe Street and Regent Street areas. So I'm hopeful that some of these new residents could support businesses as well. Thank you. Are there further uh, observations or comments? Um, uh, Commissioner Cantrell. I uh, agree with uh, Commissioner Soltheim. Uh, I, I went out to this site several times. I read all the comments and and, and um, I drove around and, and looked at other uh, buildings that the Plan Commission approved in similar uh, uh, situations. And this is a, a difficult site because of the topography uh, uh, and, and its relationship to uh, uh, the the streets that it fronts and 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 the, and the neighborhood and and I think the the developer has done an an, uh, an adequate job of of addressing the the edge the northern edge which which is is really the most con of concern here um, uh, uh, the to the single family houses uh, he is he has stepped back the um, the building. And the the fourth floor uh, will not likely be visible from from uh, from the from the north. Uh, and as you drive along the streets, uh, so I guess um, uh, overall, the the city obviously needs housing, and this is a very desirable area to live. And 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 I think that um, that's another reason uh, that I'm I'm recommending that this be approved. Uh, it's it's, uh, I, it's, I think it's a good project. Uh, and uh, I think the, the small 800 square feet of commercial, um, I, I think it's appropriate on this site. Uh, hopefully the other air, other nodes, uh, the other sites within this node will have additional commercial 
that's walkable for the neighborhood. But but because of the configuration on this on this site, there uh, 800 square feet is about the the limit. And if you provide more uh, uh, commercial or retail space, you need more parking uh, for the customers. So I think that the balance here. Uh, of of the of the amount of commercial and the residential and 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 what the architect and the developer have attempted to do with uh, setbacks and stepbacks, I think that's why I'm supporting it, and I recommend that the plan commission do as well. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Vitiver. Hi. Um, so. Um, one of the biggest challenges of being an alder is both representing the interests of your district as well as the city of as a whole. And certainly you've heard from the neighbor residents um, who are largely opposed to the project, um, particularly those who are directly north of the building who would be most impacted. Um, and of course, they're concerned about the neighborhood plan, which again, the developer has addressed in terms of why he's deviating from that plan. Um, if we think about the city as a whole, this is exactly the kind of development that we want. It's infill on existing impervious surface, it's mixed use, it provides needed housing. Um, so I just trust in all of you as plan commissioners to use the standards to make the best decision possible tonight. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Alder, and speaking up. Um, are there other comments, input, thoughts? Commissioner Fernandez. Thank you, Chair Zellers. I, I want to just really express some appreciation for uh, Commissioner Solheim and Cantrell for really explaining this and all the questions that were asked. I will say, quite frankly, um, I came into this having read everything with uh, opposed to it because I had hopes for that corner remaining of uh, an active, vital commercial area. Um, I live in the area, not close enough to really be, a, a, you know, I, I don't feel like I have to disclose a, a, a conflict of interest. But, you know, I, I would love to see that be activated, and I don't think 800 square feet does it. But following everything here, I've, I'm persuaded that this is, this is what needs to happen on that particular difficult site. Um, I'm concerned about the vision triangle. I would like to see that solved uh, with work, further work with uh, traffic engineering. I'm concerned about trash pickup. I, I, it's one thing for the trash truck to go down the street and grab a trash can in a couple of seconds, but to stop and pick up a dumpster is going to be, it's going to take longer. Or somebody's got to roll it out there. So I'm concerned about that. I'd like to see those issues get further discussion and modification, but I wouldn't want to stand in front of the whole project on that basis. So um, I have to say a little bit reluctantly, it doesn't feel like mixed use to me. It doesn't feel it makes the neighborhood more vibrant or walkable, but given everything, the constraints there, um, I, I'm supporting. Thank you, Commissioner Fernandez. Commissioner Shepard? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to say if, if this is approved, we need to make clear that it meets in the um, staff report. Uh, it's highlighted standards 5 and 12. We need to be clear that this um, actually meets, once again, standards in the code, standard 5, which uh, references um, adequate utilities, access roads, boat parking, those sorts of internal, once again, um, circulation, and also uh, 12 that has to uh, do with the height of the building. So I think that's, that's been discussed, but I think we need to be clear that, you know, standards 5 and 12 have been met. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Shepard. Commissioner Spencer. Thank you. I just also wanted to voice my support for the project. I also had uh, concerns about safety with that driveway and that corner. Um, I don't drive down there very often, but every time I do, it's, um, you know, always uh, fun and interesting. And so I do have concerns about that. But overall, I do support the project. Um, I think it's adding 
you know, just a little bit of density in a great area. And I think it's going to be one of those projects where um, we drive by or take the bus by and, and think like, you know, we made a good decision. This, this looks like um, a great building and it's going to be a good fit. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Spencer. Any other comments? Seeing no raised hands, we'll come to a vote. I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, motion passes unanimously. Uh, next business by members, does anybody have anything they would like to raise? Uh, then moving on to the secretary's report, Heather. Thanks again, Chair Sellers. Um, first, looking forward to seeing you on Thursday. Uh, we have a, a full evening for you. And um, as you as you sift through the materials that we sent late last week, please feel free to reach out to staff in advance if you have some questions. Otherwise, looking forward to your questions and discussion on Thursday. Um, looking ahead to April 11th, uh, we will have a quick update on the, the annual Conference of Plan Progress update. Um, we'll also have uh, something that the Plan Commission hasn't seen in some time. We've been working with the town of Cottage Grove on an intergovernmental agreement for our far east side and sort of the, the long-term um, growth area for the city on the east side. That'll be in front of the Plan Commission. Um, and then I'll just, uh, I think I'll move ahead then to April 25th, some of the major items on the 25th. Starting out with two very different plan amendments, a look at the Yahara Hills Neighborhood Development Plan Amendment. Um, this is for foreseeing uh, the county's investment in a continued landfill operation on the southeast side. And uh, we wanna try to move forward with plan amendments in that area as that land use may really impact some of the planned land uses in the current plan. And then secondly, um, more of a development-driven plan amendment to so the Shank Atwood Starkweather Worthington Park neighborhood plan, uh, really related to the third bullet item there. There's a proposed um, plan development zoning for a 32-unit three-story building on Linden Avenue. And so that Shank Atwood plan amendment is related to that development proposal. It'll be before you. And then fourth on the list there, on the 900 block of East Washington Avenue, a, a major alteration um, on the 900 block to uh, basically change what had been approved as an 11 story office building uh, to more of a mixed use building with, with office and uh, apartments on that site. And so that'll be back before you. And of course, going to the Urban Design Commission as well. And I think I'll leave it there with those major, major projects and um, look forward again to seeing you on Thursday. Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you all for the thoughtful discussions. Um, really appreciate it and uh, see you on Thursday. Oh, we have to have a motion to adjourn. Uh, could I get a motion moved by Commissioner Cantrell and seconded by Commissioner Hagenau and I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Thank you, now goodbye <laughs> and see you Thursday. <laughs>